And look at that. We are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the pre-show of today's 2201101 Core 1 A Plus Study Group. Well, that's not the that's not the picture I was hoping for. <laughs> that's a problem. See, we always run into this right as we're getting going. But this is this is a good time for me to actually go through and do the things I need to do. So there's a couple things I'm going to change about my setup right now. So you get to watch while I disconnect things. Oh, let's disconnect this and see what happens. That's what we want. So much better. See, you just have to just start unplugging things. When all else fails, just disconnect. That's how it works. Hey, chat room. How's everybody doing? We are trying to get our act together here. We're checking cameras, making sure it all works. It does all appear to work. It seemed to be darker than usual. It seemed to be in the dark. More dark than I wanted. I wanted a little more light in the background. I don't know if I'll be able to do that before we do this. There's always something, right? You always have to tweak it a little bit. Nope, those are at 100%, so we're going to leave them where they are. It's, it's nice. It's comfortable. Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking in. Thanks for being here. We've got a few minutes before we get started. We start at the top of the hour. This is the pre-show where I am making sure that things are either plugged in or unplugged, I guess. That's what, I, that's what my job is. Is it plugged in? Is it not plugged in? How many streaming platforms do you operate on, Professor? Uh, this one. Let's not make this more difficult than it needs to be. One streaming platform. That makes it makes it simple. So if you're on, if you're watching me right now, you're on the YouTube. And that seems to be enough for what we're doing. Uh, if there is another platform that you think I should be looking at, thinking about, examining. I'll be glad to do that. This is actually crooked. If I can straighten that up. There we go. Um, I'll be glad to look at it. But no, you won't find me. You won't find me on the Twitch. You won't find me over uh, on the others that are out there. This is this is pretty good. This this one works relatively well uh, for that. So I I don't know if there's a if there's a, a, a thing that would be better or a place that would be better or a, I don't know. Uh, this works just fine. Twitch is just a bad place to hang out. It's just, a, it's just not this type of platform. And you're not going to find me doing, you don't want to watch me doing video games. Trust me. I like having video games, but I do not. Do, not. Um, do I have a desk tour on my page? I do. You can go to professorinvestor.com slash studio or follow the link on the homepage for studio. Yeah, I know there's people on Twitch and they do other things other than gaming, but it, it doesn't, that's not where people are hanging out to watch or get certified. So it doesn't really, it doesn't really match what we're trying to do. So I prefer um, an approach where we are focused on where you are rather than where I am. I don't think it matters how many subscribers I have, quite honestly. Don't tell YouTube I said that. I mean, it really doesn't in the big picture of things. I mean, we're trying to get people certified. We're trying to get them more knowledgeable in technology, trying to get them involved in the IT career. And if there is a better place for me to do that, if Twitch turns into that thing, well, guess where I'm going to go? I'm going to go over to Twitch. But right now, YouTube seems to be a better position for that. Um, so I think that's that just makes sense for us. Oh, it is. Uh, there's a lot going on here. Just trying to get the studio tweaked a little bit. I'm not sure I'm super happy with the camera right now. It seems a little dark. It seems, seems like I'm like too dark. But the lighting, I don't wonder what the lights are set to. Let's find out. What are they set to? Are they set to what percentage? A 3% and a the right one set to 6? Well, that's it seems like you'd be able, let's go up to 7 maybe. Don't want to go too badly there. It's a, that's slightly better. You, know, you don't want to do this. Woo! Uh, maybe 8? I think, I, think, uh, I think we'll bring it back down a little bit. 
I think eight's pretty good. We'll leave it right there. See, there's, this is what we do in the pre-show. We just we just get this together and make this happen. Could I do a video on NetBIOS? Yes, I do plan on going back in time about 20 years and doing a video on NetBIOS. I'm not sure anybody would really want to see that, but I appreciate the recommendation. <laughs> we'll do NetBIOS. It's our series of NetBIOS, Token Ring, and FDDI. A good FIDI video will get things going. No, we're, we're going to stay up to date with the latest. I don't think I'll be going backwards on this one. Uh, when will the 1100 A plus series stop? Well, we'll talk all about that in the first five minutes of this live stream as soon as we hit the top of the hour here. So you'll be able to, how can we send you donations? I don't take donations, so you can't. So there, take that. Uh, it's not, that's not really the intention. Uh, we don't need donations. I don't, I don't, I prefer not to take donations is a better way to put it. I would prefer providing you with something that provides you with value and in return, you're willing to exchange something for that value. Value for value. It's a win-win. Is now BIOS no longer required for the A+. Yeah, it's been a while. I would recommend you go check out the exam objectives. Now, if you're watching the videos and you are um, you know, having to sit through all of the ads and all of those things, you're helping me already. So don't worry about uh, needing to slide anything extra in there. We're good. We're good that way. I just prefer, we did it for a while and it just did not, I just didn't like it. I just did, it was not what I wanted to do. So I, I prefer not taking donations. Now, if you show up with a, a tr if you're pulling back a truck of money and you're thinking, where can we dump this truck of money? We can have a conversation, but I don't, th I don't think anybody's doing that. So that's not a big deal. So that's, that's the important part. Is, is dealing with that piece of it. Yo, well, thank you, chat room. If, you're, if you've got a, a blocker on your browser and you're not watching ads, then that doesn't help me. So I would appreciate you getting rid of that blocker so that we can keep doing these videos. Would be appreciated. That's, uh, that's the deal. So I have a place for the truck that backs up. Otherwise, now we're not going to worry about that. Uh, that's not, the, not what we have to do. Three minutes to go. Well, less than about two minutes to go, and we'll get this party started. I'm going to go ahead and get that going. That looks good. This looks good. We are recording down here. You can see my Cylons are going. I've been playing around with the uh, location of cameras over the last week or so. Still not happy. <laughs> still not. Still not completely happy with where that is. But you know, that's that's sort of how it works. Eventually, I will I will tune this in a little bit more, and we'll. We'll get it where I like it, which is really the challenge. Yeah, if you really want to help me like the video, subscribe to the channel. Those things are free for you, but they mean a lot to us. Uh, it does help. If you are having sound issues, I would like to know what your sound issues are like because we are sending a pretty nice stream over to YouTube right now. It sounds really good. So not really finding any sound problems here. There's, And I'm, I'm monitoring and... You can't see it, but I do have a monitor in the ear that's away from the camera. Um, so I am checking and following those things. And chat room says, sounds fine to me. Except for that guy talking all the time, it sounds fantastic. It's just he won't stop. He, that's, maybe that's your audio problem. That's, that's the problem we have at my house. Uh, that's the audio issue every night. Is me, Will he just stop? He's blah, 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 blah. Um, everything else looks really good. I guess I can pause this right here, but right as I'm doing that, that's perfect. Ah, all right. Um, we're good on numbers. Everything looks good here. I got a new access point in, which I have not tried yet. I should probably give it a shot. Are we even on it? We are. And do I get a green light? I got a green light. So the new wireless is up and running. The new ubiquity access point I installed is actually working. So thank thank goodness. We needed that for the live stream. And I got my headphone monitor, my headphone amp I replaced for those of you that were here last month. It's beautiful. It's perfect crystal clear audio in my ear now. So nice. It's like, ah, so much better. Okay. Are we at we are at the top of the hour, everybody? I think I should probably get off my uh can I double click that? I can. It's time to do a live stream. Let's see if we can get this one going. Here we go.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the April 2024 Professor Messer 2201101. That is the Core 1 A Plus Study Group. This is a study group where I create questions for you in the first hour of our study group. And if you are here live joining us, you can follow along. We ask these questions that come directly from the CompTIA exam objectives. So hopefully, if you've been paying attention and following along with our videos, you'll do just fine for what we're doing today. If you are here live, we would love it if you joined us in this live endeavor by going to your favorite browser, popping open a new browser window, and going over to the link that you see on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA. There it is. Go to that QA connection. And that is the one that will be able to bring up all of the questions that we have. If you do that, you'll even have a, a map waiting for you right there for people. I guess if I actually showed where people are, are there. Well, look at that. Look at how many people, folks over in Europe, there in the United States, you're putting your virtual pin in our, our virtual map. Everything's virtual, right? It's a virtual virtual. And in this case, a lot of people tuning in from all over. And what we will do right now, if you connect to that link, here it is again, professormesser.com slash QA, I have a question waiting for you. And it, we call this our rewind question because it's a question from last month. So if you were here last month, you probably remember this one. Hopefully you remember this one. I would very much like to uh, make sure that you remember this one by asking it again. That's sort of a good chance for all of us to see if we're able to get in and answer questions in the live stream. This question is one that asks, a network administrator has identified an ethernet cable with swapped pins. Which of the following provided this information? Was it an inductive probe, a cable tester, a punch down tool, a tone generator, or a loopback plug? The only rule we have with these live streams is that you cannot answer in the chat room. I guess you could, but please don't. And please no hints in the chat room. Instead, you want to follow the link on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA to follow that particular link and be able to answer that question. We are going to come back to this question in just a moment. Well, thank you for being here. We do one of these study groups every month. And we do a plus study group for core one. We do a core two study group. We do that one two days from now. You might want to come back for that one. There's a network plus study group next week and a security plus study group scheduled for the week after that. So there's always something that we are doing from a live stream perspective. And they're kind of fun because you get to follow along and answer questions and see how other people do. And it's something that's a little better than simply just watching me drone on and on. We had that conversation in the pre-show. If you would like to follow what we're doing when we are not here live, you can go to professormesser.com slash YouTube, slash Twitter, slash Instagram, slash LinkedIn, slash Discord. Just find your favorite social media site. Type in professormesser.com slash and the name of that site. And maybe we're on that site. You'll be able to follow us if we are. Uh, there's also, of course, continuing education unit credits available for watching this first hour of the live stream. One thing that you have to do is there's a process. So make sure that you listen in during this first hour. I will give you specific instructions and a super secret code that you must include with your email submission to earn that continuing education unit credit or what we com commonly refer to as a CEU. Uh, for those of you that are not certified yet, this means nothing to you. You can't collect CEUs until you are certified. But for those of you that need to renew your certification, this is one of the many ways that you can use to earn that renewal. Also let you know that we're going to talk today about content that comes directly from the 2201101 exam. That is the current version of the Core 1A Plus exam. As many of you are aware, there are two exams you have to pass to earn your A Plus certification, the Core 1 and the Core 2. Technically, they are the 2201101 and 2201102. These are exams that were released on April the 20th of 2022, which means that we expect these to be retired somewhere around the October 2025 timeframe. That is an estimate, but I think that's a pretty good estimate. The exams themselves are 90 minutes long. That is a total of 90 questions in the exam. You could get fewer than 90 questions in your exam. And for the core one, on this scale of 100 to 900, you need to score 675. So this could be uh, one that's very easy 
especially if you're familiar with hardware and at least the beginnings of operating systems and some networking, this may be one that you're able to get in and score that 675 to earn your core one. Then you can change your focus to the 1102 where you have to score a little bit better. You need a 700 on that scale from 100 to 900. And once you pass both of these exams, your certification is good for three years regardless of when the, the retirement date might be for these. So the second you get certified, you're on a three-year counter, which is really nice. If you'd like to know the topics that will be asked of you on these exams, there are objectives available on the CompTIA website, and they are absolutely free to download. You can find a link to that at professormesser.com slash objectives. The Core 1 exam itself covers these specific domains. It is the mobile devices domain, networking, hardware, virtualization and cloud computing, and hardware and network troubleshooting. Very self-contained. So if you study everything in the core one, I think you'll do just fine. If you know everything in the exam objectives, you will breeze right through this exam. So obviously, we're going to ask you questions today that come directly from that exam objective list. The This live stream is available for you to watch immediately afterwards on YouTube, that video format. I also create an audio-only format for this as well. It's uh, distributed in a podcast form. And you can find that at professormesser.com slash podcast. We also are available on a number of your favorite streaming services, so if you go to Spotify and you search for Professor Messer, you will also find these on that as well. Might be a good way to listen in when you're in the car, when you're working out, or in a place where you really can't watch a screen. It's just something that makes it a little bit easier to gather those uh, specifics of that information. Of course, we do have these videos on YouTube, as I mentioned. And about a day afterwards, you'll find that the YouTube video description is populated with timestamps of questions that we asked during this live stream. This doesn't happen automatically. Once we tried putting this through AI, it was a disaster. There are certain things that, that even AI, uh, which is very much A and very little I, as it turns out, um, can't do. So fortunately, we have actual I in the form of my marketing manager, Lori, who is watching this and putting a, a list of timestamps manually into this YouTube video description. Hey, Lori. She's doing all of this, and is, you can go back years to find all of these videos already already set up and available with these timestamps already in them so that you can find what you need just a little bit faster, just to make this process of studying just a little bit easier. That's what we're trying to do here. Now, we are also on Discord. So if you like a chat room where you can talk with other people who are studying for their certifications and other technologists who might not even be studying for their certification, but they're hanging out in our community as well, we have a fantastic group of folks there. Make sure you check it out. It can be found at professormesser.com slash discord, or you can follow the discord icon at the upper right on the Professor Messer website. I also let you know that eventually you will need to take your exam, and you do have to pay for the exam to be able to take it. You could go over to the CompTIA website and pay full price for this exam, but why would you do that when there are discounted vouchers already available on the Professor Messer website? Go to professormesser.com slash vouchers. Not only are these discounted for folks that are in the US and Canada, but we also have a little bonus for you. If you purchase from my site, you get a copy of my exam hacks ebook. This is a list of tips and tricks that I've created specifically for CompTIA exams that will help you with the study process, and it might even help you gain a few points during the exam itself. Yes, I have strategies in here that you can use during the exam to help you score the best you can. They're included for free when you purchase the voucher from my site. Find out more about that at professormesser.com slash vouchers. Let's go back to that question I asked earlier. This was our rewind question from last month, and it asked, what uh, asked a network administrator has identified an Ethernet cable with swapped pins. Which of the following provided this information? Was it inductive probe, cable tester, punch down tool, tone generator, or loopback plug? Now, there are a number of options here, and a number of you have put in your answers. So let's see what you think the answer was on this one. We'll stop the poll, and 76% of you say that cable tester is the right answer. We've got 10% that say the answer is loopback plug. 
5% say tone generator, 4% say punch down tool, and 3% say inductive probe. So a clear winner as far as the voting is concerned of cable tester. Well, for those of you that were here last month, you know the answer was indeed cable tester, and that is the right answer. That is the one piece of equipment in this list that can provide you with details about pins that may be swapped inside of those connectors on both sides of that connection. This is a, a great tool for not only identifying swapped wires inside of your connectors, it can also provide information on continuity to make sure that pin one really is all the way through the wire connecting to pin one on the other side. So a great tool to have just to confirm that you may have crimped everything properly. But if you need more information, like understanding crosstalk values, understanding how much loss of signal you're getting, not only at the near end or the far end, you can calculate those with things like a, a frequency tester uh, and other tools to be able to provide that. Commonly, cable testers are relatively simple to be able to find that. So this is one where if you are someone who is familiar with cable testers, then you knew absolutely that was the right answer. Punch down tools are the devices used to punch a wire into a punch down block. So that's not gonna provide you with any information about pins that may be swapped. A tone generator is used in conjunction with an inductive probe to find a cable but it doesn't tell you if pins are swapped inside of that cable. That's really just a way to locate where a cable might be, especially when you have these large amounts of cable that are coming through a wall and into a punch down field of hundreds or even thousands of connections. And then lastly, a loopback plug is commonly used to test the physical interfaces on a device or physical cables on a connection. They are not going to provide you with information on pins that may be swapped. The only device that can do that in this list is the one that 76% of you chose, which is Cable Tester. You must have remembered or knew, knew this one from our last month's study group. Well done in finding the right answer for this study group. It's one that uh, if you don't, don't know any of these tools, they are all from the CompTIA exam objectives. Make sure you're familiar with those objectives because pretty much everything is going to be in there. Well, let's talk uh, about new questions. That was a question from last month. Let's do some new ones. And as many of you know, the first new question that we do in our study group is one that is associated with a performance-based question. As many of you also know, the question that we just had was a multiple choice question. So there's a, a question and then you can choose from multiple answers. Well, this gives you at least in this particular case, a 20% chance of getting it right, even if you didn't know what the answer was. So CompTIA has created a number of questions at the beginning of your exam that are not multiple choice. Usually it's about a handful. So I have for you a question that is a performance-based question for you today. This is a bit of a visual performance-based question. So if you're listening on the podcast side, you'll probably want to hit that 30 second forward button a couple of times, just so you can get past this question that asks, name the connector. That's pretty much it. That's the question. And on the screen, you will see there are four connectors here. Now, unlike the actual CompTIA exam, I didn't give you any choices to choose from. This is effectively a fill in the blank which we don't tend to see on CompTIA exams, just so you're aware. So I am making this a little bit harder than an actual exam, but I think if you're studying, sometimes it's good to have a little bit harder question to pull from. That way, if you get this question on your exam, it becomes a little bit easier. So these are four connectors that I have on the screen. Um, the only thing I can tell you is that most of them are blue. They're pretty much a blue or shade of blue. That's all, I don't know why it worked out that way, it just did. Uh, I think there are many, many connectors we have in the industry that are black. They are, there's some that, especially in fiber connectors and some copper connectors, there's specific colors. But in this case, we have these four on the screen. So I want you to name these four connectors. You go to the link on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA, and put in what you think connector one happens to be, connector two, connector three, and connector four. So there's only four on the screen. We should be able to figure out what these four connectors are. I will also tell you that these four connectors are connectors that are listed in the CompTIA exam objectives. So if you're looking at them and you're wondering, 
I haven't seen that one. I'm not sure which one that is. Make, make a note of it when we get to the answers so that you can go back to the list and see all of the different connectors. And there's only four on the screen here. I could have put 10 different connectors on the screen. So there, there's a lot that you can gather from this single question. And he, perhaps even more difficult with this one is that it's the fill in the blank. We have to know these names to be able to answer the question. So make sure you input your answer. Go to professormesser.com slash QA. You can tell me what you think the answer happens to be. Name that connector. It's a, it's a, tra it's a show from the 70s. Name that connector. I can name that connector in three letters. I think I can. Three letters. Showing my age is what we're doing right now. Nobody knows Ron Ely. So you have to, Ron, I thought it was Ron E. Lee. Like, like his middle name was E. I don't think that was the case, was it? I think it was Ron Ely. Uh, Tarzan, right? Now we're really stretching our, our knowledge of culture, of pop culture specifically. So we'll, we'll try to roll that back a little bit. Uh, this is a pretty good one. Uh, this is one where we do have to know connectors. So let's step through these one at a time to see what this happens to be. Uh, this, is, this should be a, a one that we'll step through. Uh, we'll start with number one, and we'll just step through all of them as we go. So let's go with that first connector. This is, looks like a kind of an antiquated style connector, isn't it? It's got this uh, first an odd blue color to it, and then it has uh, kind of a, a D sub miniature connection at the end with nine pins. That's all we know about this connector. So if we know a little bit more about it, we can kind of break this down and understand what these connector types happen to be. This first connector is a DB9. Uh, D sub miniature is what the D is for because the connector itself is, has a D on it. You can see that it sort of looks like a D. Not a great picture of it there, but it's, it has a, a visual that's very D-shaped if you want to look at it that way. Uh, this is the B in the DB9 describes the size, the physical size of the connector itself. Technically, this is an E size, but we call it a B size in this particular view. Why, why do we do that? Well, we do that because originally we worked with the DB25 connector, which is a much larger connector with 25 pins in it. So obviously, it's a little bit bigger than that one. Well, when we came out with this smaller style serial connection, it's only nine pins. Turns out you don't need all 25 pins to be able to have just a single serial connection. You just need nine. You actually don't even need nine. We need fewer than that, but that's the, cho the size we chose. Well, because it was a D sub miniature connection, everyone thought that the connector was DB, but actually it's DE. Well, there you go. There's a little bit of trivia for you in the world of this. And nine, obviously, is because it's nine pins. So I will accept DB9 or, for those of you that are pedantic like me, DE9 is perfectly reasonable. If you see either one of those, it's really referring to the same connector type. So it's one of those where we know DB9 is wrong and we still continue to use it, and we're fine with that. So you should be as well. Next on our list, number two, is an ST connector. ST stands for straight tip, as many of the others that are there. Uh, this is, I think, one of the more common styles of fiber connection, not because it's fantastic. It's actually quite large in the world of fiber connectivity these days, but it's just been around for so long that you will probably be able to walk into any significantly sized data center and find fiber connections that are using the ST connector type. Another nice part about these connectors is when you connect them, there is a twist. There is a, a, a bayonet connector at the end of it so that you can push it in, twist it about a quarter of the way, an eighth of, a, of, of the way around, and it locks in place. So it can't easily be pulled out of the connection. So ST straight tip was the second one in our list. Third on our list is this really unusual, what, what you think might be a connector that looks similar, looks familiar, but then again, not as familiar. If you chose a USB connection, you would be correct. It is a USB connection. Specifically, it was introduced with the USB 3.0 standard. It is the standard B plug. 
Uh, this is a connection, if you go back to the earlier versions of USB, USB 2.1 and previous, then you know that connector was not quite as large, but when we got to the higher speeds of USB 3.0, we needed some additional pins, and this particular connector got a little bit of a makeover. We don't often see these on computers. These connectors are often on the device that we're connecting to, such as a printer. And then lastly, number four, another fiber connector, as you can see in this view. This fiber connector is an SC connector. This is uh, commonly referred to as a subscriber connector, which makes no sense. But there it is. That's what it is. It is a subscriber connector. Uh, some people refer to it as a square connector, which I think is a good way to think about it because it is one of the few fiber connections that is a square. It's just squared off here. You can see there are, of course, these notches on the side. It is designed that it can only plug in one particular way. There's these, uh, the fiber or the plastic on the side allows the fiber to go in one single type of connection. But I think there's uh, a good reason to have these SC connectors still around. This one plugs in and locks in with this connection type itself. The, the outside of the connection um, is a lock, and you have to, to pull it out just a little bit for it to unlock from the connection. So again, you can't easily pull it out and have something there that you can pull from. So a, a certainly a good way to plug in a connection. It's still relatively large. There are smaller fiber connection types which are covered in the CompTIA exam objectives, but these are two of the more popular ones that you will find in any particular data center. So those are the four connectors we were looking for. Connector one is a DB9. Connector two is a straight tip ST connector. We also have a USB 3.0 standard B plug as the USB connection in this list. And our last blue connector of the day, the SC connector, the subscriber connector. I don't know what subscriber they're referring to, but there it is. This, the SC connection, another common one that you'll run into. Hopefully, you were familiar with those connector types and you were able to put those into your list. One of the things that I find very useful is, is knowing the connection types by sight. So you may want to go to the CompTIA exam objectives, type in the connector type into your favorite search engine, which probably has an image search as well, and click the image search. And you'll see a lot of different connections come up and you'll start to see what does that connection look like. So you can, of course, look at the videos there. This is one that I think might help you as you're going through the details of the exam. This is a, a great thing to know is visually. So check the back of a computer, know what every connection type is. The back of infrastructure devices, fiber connections, limit your view to what's in the CompTIA exam objectives and you'll do just fine. If you got those four right, then you did very well on today's, this month's uh, exam, um, this, this performance-based question from the exam. I think this is one you should absolutely be familiar with if you're planning to study for your A-plus exam. Let's shift gears now back to a multiple choice question. Here is the first new multiple choice question for us today. And this question says, a monitor shows text on the screen even when no video output is active. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this issue? Would this be a non-native resolution, dead pixels, incorrect video input, burn in, or faulty HDMI cable? Those are our five options here. The question again asks, a monitor shows text on the screen even when no video output is active. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this issue? Is it non-native resolution, dead pixels, incorrect video input, burn in, or faulty HDMI cable? Do you think you know? This would be your link on the screen that you can submit your answer. Go to professormesser.com slash QA. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We're going to pretend we're watching and taking the exam without any other type of input. So no Googling. You got to watch this video. You got to input the answer. Nothing in the chat. I think you know the rules at this point. Professormesser.com slash QA to submit your answer. Yes, I don't think the SC connector we can say is generally used by end users or subscribers to the network. That doesn't, generally the end users aren't connecting via fiber. So that doesn't make any sense to me either. I guess from a 
a, a, a provider's perspective, if you're dealing with a large service provider, you could argue that these are the subscriber connectors. But again, that doesn't make sense either. It's just a fiber connection. It's not, there's nothing special about it that makes it for only for subscribers. I could use an ST connector. I can use an, an RJ connector. I could use a lot of different fiber connectors to use. So I don't know. That's just uh, how it works from that point. Yeah, it's not used in fiber to your house either. So that's another one. You're not going to find an SC connector commonly used in that case. Uh, so I don't know. I, uh, certainly, you could use an SC connector for fiber to the house, but that's not what it's used for. So subscriber connector is kind of an odd thing. Sort of that, that idea of an F connector. The F connector stands for literally the letter F. There, there's, no, there's nothing behind it. So I'm wondering if it's, it's the same thing. Same thing that there's really nothing behind that to look at. Let's see how you did with this question. A monitor shows text on the screen even when no video output is active. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this issue? Would it be non-native resolution, dead pixels, incorrect video input, burn in, or a faulty HDMI cable? And if we stop, we can see that 65% say that is burn in, although we can see that 24% say it's an incorrect video input. We also have 5% that say it's a faulty HDMI cable, 3% say non-native resolution, and then 1% say dead pixels. So this is obviously the majority, 65%, that say burn in is what we are looking for. And if you are someone who has been working with a monitor that has been constantly showing the same thing over and over and over again, you will find burn in as a significant problem. Uh, this is one you can even see it on this screen. I've got a better view of this from this. We'll look at this screen in a moment. So after, after showing something on the screen for an extended period of time, these monitors, especially LCD, OLED, and other types of flat screen monitors and CRTs, will eventually only show that image on the screen, even when the monitor is turned off. Uh, showing that on the screen. So this is a good example of what this looks like. You can see this is one at an airport. It used to show on time. In fact, there used to be different columns here, it looks like, on this one. And you can make out what the what the words were when it was showing that all the time. Then it the, looks like they changed some of the, the, the formatting of the screen. But when they changed the formatting, now suddenly you can see the burn in that is there behind it. So that doesn't help very much if you're someone who is trying to, to use your monitor. It's kind of distracting to see that there. Sometimes you can get rid of the burn in by showing other things like a, a bright white screen or a black screen showing a black or other off black color, like a gray or, or a shaded color. Sometimes that can help. Uh, sometimes it won't. You simply have to replace the monitor when those types of things happen. Many monitors have a shifting feature where they will now notice when something on the screen is not changing, and it will move those items by a pixel or two. So that they it changes the pixels that are there. So there's really a limited amount of burn-in that can happen. Burn-in is absolutely what we were looking at here. We can see that twenty about 25% of you said incorrect video input. Uh, unusual for something like that to happen. I suppose if you had multiple inputs going into a monitor, this is that might be the case. But the question says when no video output is active, which would also imply no video output on other connections onto that monitor, which means we probably don't have a case of an incorrect video input we really are having a problem with burn-in. Non-native resolution would show itself as the screen being a little bit fuzzy, not as sharp as it could be. And in that particular case, we can turn the monitor off and everything turns off. We can change to another screen, and we don't have other images on the screen. So non-native resolution would not have this particular problem either. A faulty HDMI cable would probably show up as a corruption on the screen. It would be a blockiness on the screen of some of the data, and it might occur occasionally. Or maybe the screen occasionally goes black for a second and then comes back. That would certainly be indicative of a faulty HDMI cable. But it, uh, having text on the screen when no video output was there, well, that's not your cable. That's something that is a problem with the monitor itself. And then lastly, dead pixels. Dead pixels are pixels that will never change color. They will always be black. And usually, there might be one, sometimes two, 
sometimes more than two, but very few would appear on the monitor somewhere. Um, it is the case that the dead pixels can be annoying, but they're not gonna show other video output when the monitor is not turned on or not active or on a different screen. So in this case, the only, or in, as the question says, the most likely reason for this particular issue is indeed burn in and 65% of you got that one absolutely correct. Let's do another one. We got another question all queued up for you. This question asks, which of the following security features is associated with the Bluetooth pairing process? Is it a password hash, a fingerprint scan, encrypted session key, personal firewall, or personal identification number? Got a few security features in there. This one is for the Bluetooth pairing process. Is it password hash, fingerprint scan, encrypted session key, personal firewall, or personal identification number? Do you think you know the answer? Please follow the link on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. And then we will we'll see how you do. A lot of you locked yours in pretty quick on this one. Is this going to be one where we all get it right or is it going to be one where we all get it wrong? I, I never know. Sometimes it's just a mix. It's hard for me to really tell. I try not to look at the answers. I have it on my screen. I can see the answers as they are, are queuing up. So I do have a way to view that. But I kind of like waiting with you to see what the answer happens to be. This is one that does come directly from the CompT exam objectives. You do need to understand the Bluetooth pairing process. You've probably done this before. But this can be one of these things that you do it once, and once it's paired, you're done. You may not even realize how you paired that Bluetooth device a year ago to your mobile phone. So it's useful during the troubleshooting process to understand how to make that happen. Speaking of making it happen, let's see how you made this one happen. Which of the following security features is associated with the Bluetooth pairing process? Is it password hash, fingerprint scan, encrypted session key, personal firewall, or personal identification number? And as expected, 70% of you say it's a personal identification number. However, 19% of you say encrypted session key is the security feature associated with Bluetooth pairing. 6% say it's password hash, and then 3% with firewall, and less than a percent say it is a fingerprint scan. So we had people that thought across the board that this could be a number of different things. Bluetooth pairing can be a, a challenge sometimes if you don't follow the steps. And it seems that there is a very common set of steps that you would use. The one that is probably the most popular, in fact, I just did this yesterday with a Bluetooth device. I'm trying to remember what exactly I was connecting to that had this pin associated with it. There was a personal identification number that it showed on my screen. And it said, make sure the Bluetooth device has the same number on its screen so that you know you're adding the correct Bluetooth device to your system, which is a good tip, by the way. You don't want to add some unknown Bluetooth device to your computer, to your mobile device. Never want to have that happen. Personal identification numbers allow you to do that. And it will allow you to pair one device at a time with these personal identification numbers to confirm that you really are adding the right device. And that's why personal identification number came up as 70% of you answering that one. That is the right answer. Now, why would it not be one of these other answers? Encrypted session key sounds pretty secure. That sounds like something we would like to have in a secure pairing method between systems. But could you imagine someone who just needs to have their earbuds connected Bluetooth to their phone having a session key of some kind and having that session key somehow get transferred to the ear pods, that seems like a complicated process for most people. It sounds like a complicated process for trained system administrators. So encrypted session keys, although they are very useful to have on a web browser session when you're connecting to a bank, to professormesser.com or to other websites, doesn't really help during the Bluetooth pairing process. We also have a password hash. And for those of you that have paired Bluetooth devices before, you know that there is no password between these devices. Uh, there's not a, a code that you have to type in. This is all done with a verification of a pin between both of those devices. We also have a personal firewall. 
Not every device has a personal firewall, and it's not necessary to have a personal firewall to be able to pair devices using Bluetooth. And a fingerprint scan, although that sounds like something that would also be pretty secure, fingerprint scans are not required for Bluetooth pairing. Once you have your phone open, of course, you can use Bluetooth pairing. Maybe your phone unlocks itself with a fingerprint scan, but that is not part of the Bluetooth pairing process. In this case, the answer that 70, almost 71% of you chose is a personal identification number, and that is the answer that we were looking for in this particular question. You guys did great with that one. I think a number of you have worked through Bluetooth before. Now, as you've probably seen already, we've covered physical connections, we've covered networking, we've covered mobile devices already, we probably snuck a little security in there, and this is pretty common for the A-plus exam, is that you have to know a lot about a lot of different topics. In fact, if you go through my A-plus course, both the Core 1 and Core 2, it's 137 videos long, 19 hours in duration. So there's a lot to go through, and hopefully you're able to go through all 137 videos, plenty of videos to look through. But one of the challenges with any time you're working through one of these is that maybe you don't have time to go through 19 hours of content. Maybe there's some videos you simply aren't able to go through. Well, I've taken all of the text, all of the important graphics, all of the tables, and everything important for you to know from every single one of those videos, and I put them into one single document. These are my course notes. My course notes are designed to give you a feel for the things that are important for your exam. And of course, I have course notes for Core 1, for Core 2, and for other certifications as well. The, this is the PDF, the digital version of my course notes. It's the same as the physical version of my course notes. We have this both in a digital and physical format. You can see they, they're effectively identical to each other, except one is obviously on your screen and one is in your hand. When you get the physical version, by the way, if you choose as this as your option, uh, you get the digital version for free. So while you're waiting for me to ship this to you, because it is physical and I do have to send it to you, um, this is shipped anywhere in the world to you, but you're able to download the digital version immediately. Uh, this digital version has a lot of great intel in it, a lot of information that you can pour through, and we have them available for both the Core 1 and the Core 2 exam. If you get both of those at the same time, there's even a little bit of a cost break. So you might want to look into that as well. Find out more about it at our website. Go to professormesser.com slash 1101 notes for more information on our course notes. It's also a great way to support what we do here. Hopefully that's the win-win that we were talking about in our pre-show where you now have something that can help you get over that line and earn your A-plus certification. And you're doing that with content that we've created over the number of years that we've been doing this. It's something that really does help us quite a bit and helps keep the lights on. So you really, really are helping us, hopefully just as much as we're helping you. Find out more on our website, professormesser.com slash 1101 notes. Let's do another question. Off to the next one. This question asks, a company's email server is sending email notifications to all clients. Which of the following firewall ports should be opened to allow these notifications? Would this be TCP 445, TCP 25, TCP 3389, TCP 161, or excuse me, UDP 161, or TCP 22? A lot of numbers and a lot of TCPs and UDPs in this question. The question again asks, a company's email server is sending email notifications to all clients. Which of the following firewall ports should be opened to allow these notifications? Is it TCP 445, TCP 25, TCP 3389, UDP 161, or TCP 22? Do you think you know the answer? Follow the link on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We're going to see if we know our port numbers today. For those of you familiar with the A+, you know there's an entire section on networking, and you do need to understand this core set of port numbers. We use these port numbers all the time to create firewall rules to understand uh, how different communications are occurring between devices. If you're looking at a packet capture, it's really helpful to know what these port numbers are because you may be finding them in your packet capture itself. 
So that's why I know a lot of us that have never worked on networks before, this may be a little bit more of rote memorization. But there are great ways to help memorize these, and I highly recommend you stick to the list that is in the CompTIA exam objectives. That's going to be important as well. Find out more about this. Uh, let's see how we do. Let's see how we did on this one. A lot of you have locked in your answer already, so we get to see how well we know port numbers. The question again asked, a company's email server is sending email notifications to all clients. Which of the following firewall ports should be open to allow these notifications? Is this TCP 445? TCP 25, TCP 3389, UDP 161, or TCP 22? Well, what did you answer? Let's find out. We'll close the poll, and we can see on our list that 58% of you say the answer is TCP 25. 17% say the answer is TCP 445. Then we go to single digits, 9% for TCP 22, 7% for TCP 3389, and 6% for UDP 161. Well, we have 58%, almost 60% of you say the answer is TCP 25. First, it's useful if we look at the question itself, which says it's an email server sending email notifications. The email servers themselves, that is a really important clue because now there is a limited number of port numbers that are going to be very useful to be able to understand what the answers or where this, this response from this device might come from. It's only coming from an email server. So if you really know your port numbers, you can really limit the scope of what the possibilities might be. And for this particular case, this email server sending information is using the well-known protocol, the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, or SMTP. SMTP is designed for email servers to be able to send information to other email servers. We also have SMTP that can be configured on single devices. So if you are sending information to an, a specific user from your device, you may be sending it directly to the SMTP server using the SMTP protocol. This protocol very commonly uh, uses TCP port 25 if you're sending SMTP over a non-encrypted link, although SMTP port 25 is also commonly used for encrypted connections as well, although there is a different uh, port number that you might want to use for encrypted connectivity. If you're not sure what port number is being used by the SMTP servers that you need to connect to, you can always connect or communicate to the system administrator or the the organization that is managing those servers to find out what port number you should be using to send that information. This is an important one. Obviously, we don't want to have to call somebody every time we send an email. So we very commonly use these well-known port numbers to be able to do this. So port numbers, uh, SMTP especially for port numbers, can be very useful. There are other protocols that you may find in use when we're talking about email. Two other very popular email protocols are IMAP and POP3. So in our particular case, though, a, an email server sending this information means that we were indeed talking about SMTP, and we were talking about TCP port 25. And that is indeed the one that most of you chose. 58% of you chose that as your answer. TCP 445, very commonly used for direct communication over server message block, or I the other way around, server message block being sent over TCP. This is one that is commonly associated with Windows. Windows uses server message block as a way to transfer files, as a way to communicate between shares, as a way to send print jobs. Kind of Microsoft's way of transferring data is being able to use server message block over TCP 445. We have 9% of you that said TCP port 22. That's commonly used for secure shell, or SSH, which is great for connecting to and being able to use connections for um, for a console connection to a remote device, very commonly used for that. So if you're connecting to a firewall, if you need to configure a switch, if you're connecting to a Linux server, you would very commonly use Secure Shell or SSH, which uses TCP port 22. We have TCP 3389. 7% of you chose that one. That is the remote desktop protocol port number. So if you're using RDP, another Windows-centric protocol, then you're probably using TCP port 3389. And then lastly, UDP port 161, which only 6% of you chose, is commonly used for Simple Network Management Protocol, SNMP, 
which is not the same as SNTP. There's a lot of abbreviations we have to know for this one. And SNMP uses UDP port 161 for the simple network management protocol. The answer here, again, TCP port 25. That's what we're using for SNTP. Ooh, a lot of mail. SMTP for the mail trans, simple mail transfer protocol. Almost 60% of you got that one absolutely right. You're spot on with that one. That's exactly the right answer. Let's do another question. This next question on our list, what? You want a printer question? I'd love to give you a printer question. This is a question that asks, the output from a printer is fading due to a used printer ribbon. Which of the following printer types is most likely in use? Is this inkjet, 3D, thermal, impact, or laser? The output from a printer is fading due to a used printer ribbon. Which of the following printer types is most likely in use? Is this inkjet, 3D, impact, laser? Well, I skipped one. Inkjet, 3D, thermal, impact, or laser? We've got to get all of them in there, right? So those are the answers. If you think you know the answer, follow the link on your screen. There it is, professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. You want to instead lock in your answer with the link on your screen. Pop open a new browser window. You can just leave it there on professormesser.com slash QA to be able to do this. So let's see how you do with this question. A lot of you have locked in your answers very quickly. Now again, that makes me wonder, did we all get it right or did we all get it wrong? That's, that's the real question. I think we did pretty well on this one. We usually do well on printer questions, right? We usually do pretty well understanding differences, how we would use the printers. Printer troubleshooting is a big part of any technician, it seems. You start to get a familiarity with printers once you spend some time with them after a while. You, you understand the idiosyncrasies and what the differences are with those. Uh, let's see how you did with this one. The question again asks, the output from a printer is fading due to a used printer ribbon. Which of the following printer types is most likely in use? Is it inkjet, 3D, thermal, impact, or laser? Laser. Uh, the, the answers, though, all over the place. 54% say impact, 21% say inkjet, 12% say thermal, 10% say laser, only one non uh, uh, one only one one answer that was chosen did not get double digits, which is one percent said 3D. So nobody thinks it's 3D. Very few of you think it is 3D. So we want to know what the answer is, or what is in what the right answer is in in this particular case. If we go with the majority, 54 percent of you that said impact, then we would probably be spot on. Uh, impact printers commonly use ribbons like the one you see on the screen here. Every printer has a different sized ribbon. So when you're buying the ribbons, you have to make sure you get the right one for your printer. And they are one long loop of, of fabric. So this is not one where it goes all the way through and you're done. It actually is one long loop of fabric. If you were to somehow get into the ribbon cartridge, you would see that it was just one long ribbon that happens to be in here. But it also makes it easy to replace. You just take the whole cartridge and put in a brand new cartridge with ink on it, and you're in good shape again. Uh, back in the day when we had so many of these ribbons, uh, we, would, we would have some ways that you could re-ink the ribbons. What a mess. You don't want to get into that one. It really is much less expensive and much easier if you simply just buy a new ribbon. If you were to take the top off of the ribbon cartridge, you would see the ribbon was just inside rolled up like this. So you can see that it's just one long loop, which means once you go through the first time, it's going to go through again and then again and then again. And then after a while, it, gets the, it starts to fade. It gets lighter and lighter on the page, which makes sense. We're getting rid of all of that ribbon that happens to be in there. Therefore, ink, the impact printer becomes a lighter and lighter impact on the page. So that's your, your cue to remove the cartridge and put in a new ribbon cartridge so that we can get a much better view on the paper itself. Those are exclusive to impact printers. 54% of you knew this, and that is the right answer. What we're, we're doing with these is absolutely where we can focus our efforts. Inkjet printers, it's interesting that 21% of you got inkjet printer as the answer, probably because we were talking about 
a fading ribbon, you might have been thinking, oh, there's ink in that ribbon. Therefore, it must be inkjet, right? Except inkjet printers print directly to the page using a jet of ink. We call it a jet of ink. It's really a, a very small amount of ink that is bubbled out onto the page with very, very small dots. And uh, that is one that doesn't use a ribbon. So in the case here, a used printer ribbon, not part of an inkjet printer. So unfortunately, that would not be the correct answer. Thermal printers, 12% of you have thermal printers listed. Thermal printers don't have a ribbon at all. They, they heat the page, uh, specially coated paper. And when you heat that specially coated paper, it changes colors. And that's how we get a thermal printout. If you've gotten a receipt at the store, and you notice it's on a very slick piece of paper, and it doesn't seem to have any, any ink on it. In fact, if you leave it on the dashboard of your car and come back, it's turned black. That is indeed a thermal paper that went through a thermal printer. And then we have laser printers. Those use laser beams to be able to, the second reference in a row, to be able to, uh, to change the, uh, the way that information or toner specifically sticks to the page itself. As a great way to do it is uh, is with a laser printer. But a laser printer doesn't have a ribbon either, so that would not be the right answer. And most of you know 3D printers don't have ribbons. They're using a number of different technologies to build that 3D model. Uh, but in this case, not a printer ribbon, not what we would use on 3D. The answer here is indeed an impact printer. 54% of you got that one absolutely correct. That is the right answer. Now, for those of you that are watching this video for continuing education unit credit, I would love to send you an email that certifies that you are here to watch one hour of a webinar category CEU. The way that you would earn that email is you go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website, and there is a link there that says contact us. That contact us link will bring up a form. Please put in your name, your email address. In the subject line, please put April 2024 core one. And in the body of the message, put the super secret code word of the month, impact thermal. Impact thermal is the super secret code words of the month. You have to have both of them there. Impact thermal are the super secret code words of the month. You can put anything else you would like into that email message. Uh, you don't have to, though. You can simply just put the words Impact Thermal. Hit send. That's all you need to do. It takes me about a week to turn these around. That's one that will be very useful for me to be able to find these later on and be able to send you an email that is digitally signed and certifies that you were indeed here for one hour. These are commonly used for renewing your certification. So if you are collecting CEUs for renewal, this is one way to do it. Uh, there are many different ways to collect CEUs for renewal. And you indeed, you have to do more than simply watch these videos. So you can only collect so many of these before you have to collect other types of CEUs. So make sure you are familiar with that as well. This should be uh, something that you should be familiar with. So if you're trying to figure out how do I renew my certification, in the YouTube video description of this video is a video I made on renewing your certification. And I go through many of the most popular ways to do that and what the advantages and disadvantages of that might be. We have time for more questions, so let's get a couple more in while we have some time. Next on our list is this question, and it asks, an app user notices a new feature has been added since their last login. Which of the following would best describe this model? Is it PAAS, hybrid, SAAS, community, IAAS? So there's your answers. You got to choose from one of those five. An app user notices a new feature has been added since their last login. Which of the following would best describe this model? PAAS, hybrid, SAAS, community, or IAAS? If you think you know the answer, follow the link on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. Please, no answers in the chat room. Please, no hints in the chat room. You want to instead follow the link on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA. And for those of you in the chat room that missed that CEU from earlier, you're welcome to rewind back after we're done here. Can't rewind right now on a live stream, but you are able to rewind after we're done. Once we finish the live stream, it takes a couple minutes for this to process, and then it's immediately available 
on the YouTube. You can watch it on there. And, and even if you were here this time, you might want to watch it again or two or three times or four. Uh, it's probably more important that you like or subscribe, I think. Uh, nobody wants to go through that that many times. But you can go back to any of our previous live streams. They are all archived on our YouTube channel. And you can go back and watch any of those, especially if you're studying for the latest version of the A-plus exam. This goes back a number of months. We've been doing this uh, for this version of the exam a number of years. So there's plenty of live stream content to go through. Let's see how you did with this one. How well do you know your cloud models? We're about to find out. An app user notices a new feature has been added since their last login. Which of the following would best describe this model? PaaS, hybrid, SaaS, community, or IaaS? And we can see that about 70% of you say the answer is SaaS, SaaS, as we tend to just call it. 20% though say, nope, that's a platform as a service, PaaS, which is different than the software as a service, which is SaaS. We have 5% that chose infrastructure as a service. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as hardware as a service, IaaS. We have 3% for community and 1% for hybrid. So if you go with the majority here, even more, this is a strong majority at 70%, you went with software as a service, or SaaS. This is the platform or the type of cloud system that is one that you did not develop. You don't maintain it. You don't, you don't host it. You don't store any data from it. It all happens in the cloud. It's like magic. And because of that, someone else is doing the development of this application, of that software that is running as a service. That means that when you log in, they might have upgraded their software. They might have added a new feature. They might have removed a feature, speaking from experience. So sometimes you may find that things are very different when you log in because the, the organization that is doing all of the application programming, all of the hosting, storing all of your data, protecting all of your data, hopefully, and everything else associated with that app is the hosting provider. It's the cloud provider that is providing you with software, specifically software as a service. And so in this case, that is the answer we were looking for, SaaS or SaaS for software as a service. And about 70% of you chose that one anyway. Now, we did have a large number of you, though, almost 21% of you chose platform as a service, P-A-A-S. Platform as a service is one where you have a web-based front end. You can log in to that particular service, but it's your responsibility to develop the application that is running on that service. You're the program developer. You have the team that is writing the app. So it would not be a surprise to you if you logged in and suddenly you notice there's a new feature. Well, it's not because of something you did that it cannot be platform as a service. That would be remarkable, wouldn't it? If you were the programmer and you logged in and something was new, maybe that's the AI. Yeah, that never happens. That's why we still have programmers. That's why we still have application developers. That's why we still have IT people working on these devices. Turns out the AI only goes so far. So in this case, platform as a service requires you to be the one that is doing the application development, which means you would not be surprised over a new feature suddenly being available on that particular piece. We have infrastructure as a service. 5% of you chose that one. That would be if you were in charge of the hardware and all of the software running on that device. Again, you would not be surprised that a new feature was available with infrastructure as a service because you were the one that had to upgrade it to provide that feature. But in this case, you just noticed that there was something new, cannot be infrastructure as a service. A community platform is one where multiple organizations are using the same cloud platform. Usually it's organizations that have a similar type of mission statement or role, especially if you have uh, organizations that, um, that have a single goal in mind or a similar goal in mind. They might use a community service to save costs where everybody can use the same cloud platform. And then hybrid is one that might be a combination of a public cloud and a private cloud. Many organizations do have hybrid cloud infrastructures, and that's something that's very common. But in this case, having a new software feature suddenly show up is not something associated with a hybrid cloud model. It is the software as a service. And indeed, 
about 70% of you got that one absolutely correct. That is the right answer. That's the one we were looking for in this particular case. A lot, lot to pour through. If you're someone who's trying to find the right model, the right thing in that case, that's, that's a, a really good example. Now, I know we're at the top of the hour. Let's get a couple more questions in, though, before we finish up with some of the ones that are here. I wrote all these questions out, so I feel like we should do them, right? Let's do another question. On this question, we have a computer made a loud pop and immediately powered off. Which of the following is the most likely reason for this issue? Is this because fans not spinning, capacitor failure, SSD disconnected, a Windows stop error, or a BIOS failure? None of this is good, by the way, for those of you keeping score. Uh, a computer made a loud pop and immediately powered off. Which of the following is the most likely reason for this issue? Fans not spinning, capacitor failure, SSD disconnected, Windows stop error, or BIOS failure? Let's see if you know the answer to this one. Go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. See if you know which one this one happens to be. This is, this is a bad day either way it works out. You don't, you don't want to run into this scenario. Uh, that is one where you want a computer that is 100% no popping noises. So that's, that's the real important part of this, is finding the right answer in these uh, and figuring out troubleshooting for this. You walk up, the user says, I don't know, it just turned off. We heard a loud popping noise and it just turned off. You know, not that, that can happen. So that, that is what we want. Uh, the, the popping noise can probably get somebody's attention when that happens. Um, it'd be, be kind of interesting. We know, we know that that's not ideal. We'll put it that way. We'll see how not ideal it is in just a moment once we look at your answers that are here. And you put your answers in pretty quick on this one. So let's see how you did. The question asks, a computer made a loud pop and immediately powered off. Which of the following is the most likely reason for this issue? Is it fans not spinning, capacitor failure, SSD disconnected, a Windows stop error, or a BIOS failure? Well, you chose almost... 100%, 85% of you, by far the largest answer that we've gotten so far, saying it's a capacitor failure. But is that really the right answer? Because we have 5% say fans not spinning, 5% say BIOS failure, 2% say SSD disconnected, and 1% say Windows stop error. So what would it be to have something like this happen? You want your computer to just hum along. You don't want any popping noises. You don't want any grinding noises. You don't want any crazy noises with your system. This is this can be a real challenge if you're someone who's trying to find a system and making sure it doesn't make any rattling, uh, which can certainly happen if something might be loose inside of it. And if you have a physical hard drive inside, you might even hear scraping noises. Well, those weren't the problems we ran into. We ran into not even clicking noises with the fan. We heard a pop. And if something is just a loud pop, just a single loud snapping noise on your computer and suddenly everything powers off, it's really probably a capacitor that's blown. Those tend to be very loud and dramatic when they fail. Sometimes they fail very slowly, not very dramatic at all. It doesn't have to pop to have a failure of a capacitor. Sometimes capacitors simply lose their capacity capacitiveness over time. And whenever that happens, though, you'll be able to look at the capacitor itself. Here's some some kind of very large capacitors. Many of the capacitors on your motherboard are the much smaller style, uh, the, the, the single uh, type of capacitor you would run into. But these are very visual. When you see these fail, it's very obvious when you see these larger capacitors fail. The surface mount capacitors is sometimes very difficult to see when a failure has occurred. And if we look at these capacitors, they look OK, although this one, a little suspicious. Let's zoom up on it. You can see it's bulging just a little bit out of the top of this one. So you should visually be able to tell that this capacitor does not look quite right. 
and it is possible to replace them. You have some people that are good at replacing either surface mount components, or in this particular case, this one's much easier to replace because it simply goes right through the motherboard and very easy to solder on the other side. But you'd have to look really close. Here's another one. Here's a capacitor that looks OK. We don't know if it is OK. It could still be uh, problematic, even if it looks OK. But look at how it's bulging out. This one definitely we would probably want to start our efforts at, at fixing that one. And if there's a capacitor that fails dramatically, it'll look something like this. Here's what's on the inside. This one has failed. And the, the top, the whole outside of the capacitor, the plastic that is around the outside, that popping noise, was it blowing? We talk about a capacitor blowing. That's what a, a blown capacitor really looks like. Uh, so somewhere inside of this motherboard, there is a the, the plastic pieces are out there somewhere. They probably pulled it out before making the picture. There's pieces of it just everywhere on this motherboard. This is just a mess. And the other capacitors, notice that they are swollen as well. You got a lot of capacitor problems here. This one's just dented. This is just a mess. This poor motherboard's been through quite a bit. So in this case, yeah, it's, this is a problem. Let's swap out that motherboard. Let's get you a new computer. It is indeed a capacitor failure. Most of you knew this one. You may have even run into this before. 85% of you got that one absolutely right. It would not be the case of fans not spinning. Obviously, if our computer fans aren't spinning, it'll get hotter and hotter inside of this case. And it may eventually power down because it is getting so warm that it wants to power down automatically to protect the components inside. But it's not making a popping noise when it does that. It just powers off. You may wonder, what, what just happened? In fact, you aren't, don't even know that anything went wrong. If you weren't looking at the screen when it powered off, you may not even notice it. But there's no noise when that happens. The fan's not spinning, certainly can create thermal issues, but it, not, it does not commonly uh, associate itself with a loud popping noise. Uh, we have other options, a BIOS failure, which would be related to the software that runs the system, the basic input-output system, that's your BIOS. A BIOS failure, first, is remarkably unusual. The BIOS really does not fail. These, these BIOS software that runs your system are very well developed. Uh, it's not something that certainly causes a problem on your computer. And it would not cause your computer to make any noises, certainly not popping noises. So we can rule out a BIOS failure from this particular scenario. An SSD disconnected um, normally wouldn't happen in the middle of you using the computer. But even if it did, it would simply show an error on your screen because it's not able to communicate to the SSD. And it would not cause a popping noise on your computer. And then lastly, a Windows stop error. A stop error is that blue screen that pops up. We don't like the blue screen. Uh, but when that happens, it doesn't make a popping noise. Almost should, though, shouldn't it? Should make, there should be a, a sad trombone or oh, or something. But it, there's not. There's no noises at all. It's just a blue screen that pops up. There's no popping sound or anything that would alert you other than the screen suddenly changing and being blue. So it would not be a Windows stop error. In this case, capacitor failure is the answer that we were looking for. That is the one in this case, that would be the most likely reason for this issue. And most of you knew that. 85% of you chose that as your answer. And you got that one absolutely correct. Now, some in the chat room, a number of you were saying, are this, the questions that we're getting in here, are these, are these questions that are designed to emulate the exam itself? Well, they're not. They, this is These are questions that could show up on your exam. I certainly don't write them because I'm trying to emulate exam questions, although there are some that are very much in the style of an actual exam question. But our, our goal with our, our practice questions that we do in our study groups are to study. It's to learn more about the underlying technologies so that we can answer questions from the exam. But eventually, you may find yourself wanting to answer questions that are very similar to what you would find on an actual exam. Well, we don't have access to the actual questions. That would be cheating, of course, and nobody wants to do that. And if you look around the internet, there's some pretty bad questions that you can find out there. So they're either out of scope for the exam objectives, or they simply aren't written in the same style or the same tone as the CompTIA exam itself. So knowing that, I sat down and just started writing questions. And I wrote a series of practice exams that have the same distribution of topics that you would find on the actual exam. And perhaps more importantly, they are questions 
that are very similar in style and in tone to the actual exam questions. So let's do one of these right now. Same rules apply. No answers in the chat room. Please, no hints in the chat room. Let's step through one of the questions in my book. This is from question A22 from my core one uh, exam, practice exams book. You can see it's a, this is a big book. There are a lot of questions in here and a lot of answers. This is question A22 on page nine of the book. And it asks, a server administrator has received an alert showing one drive in a RAID 1 array has failed. Which of the following would be the best way to resolve this alert? Would it be replace the bad drive and resync the array? Replace all drives in the array and resync the array? Replace the bad drive and restore from backup? Convert the array to RAID 0 and replace the drive? Or replace all drives in the array and restore from backup? Now, this is a PDF, and most PDF readers will have some type of annotation. So you can go through and annotate different parts of this. Uh, if you have this on a tablet, you have a stylus, you can even write on here because this is just has everything there that you might want to work through. Uh, this has a lot of different options available in it. Now, you'll notice that the answer to A22 is located a uh, quick answer. If you just want to know, is it A, B, C, D, or E, you can go to page 31. Now, that would involve you scrolling from page 9 to page 31. But because this is a PDF, I put links in here. Notice the, the icon that I have here turns into a little hand. That's because it will jump you very quickly to page 31. But if you want more overview, uh, a much more detailed explanation of the question and the answers, you want to go to the details on page 57. It's a hot link, so I'm just going to click that. And it takes me quickly to page 57. There's the question at the top. And it says the answer is A, replace the bad drive and resync the array. And then I explain in the answers why that is the correct answer. That's not really revolutionary. You pretty much find that very similar feature on many practice exams. What you don't find on many practice exams, however, is an explanation of the incorrect answers. This is an important part of this book because when you get a question wrong, it's an opportunity to learn why you got the question wrong, to learn more about that topic. So every time there is an incorrect answer, it's almost more important to have a detailed explanation of why that's wrong. So now it's you're sort of finishing up that, that circle of learning where you got it wrong, but now you understand why you got it wrong. And if it shows up again or shows up on a different question or if that topic suddenly appears on your exam, you will know more about it. So that's why I make sure that every answer in this book, whether it's right or whether it's wrong, gives you a little tidbit about that particular technology. I'll also recommend to you, for those of you that already have my practice exams book, make sure that if you get the question right, I highly recommend you read through the wrong answers. That's because on your exam, maybe one of the questions you get on your exam are about topics that are covered in the incorrect answers. That's another important part of this. this. These exams, the questions in this exam book, I write all of these so that there isn't any overlap. You don't have three questions in a single exam that are all on the same topic. I make sure that I have, it's a, it's a huge spreadsheet that I have when I'm writing this book. And every time I write a question, I know exactly which topic is covered and I make sure I don't cover that topic again. That maximizes your knowledge you're gonna get from this exam book. It's an important part of this. We really did put a lot of thought into building this book out and what it would provide to you. That's the practice exams book. They're both available in the PDF that you see on your screen and the physical version that I have here. Again, if you buy the physical version, you get the digital one for free. And at the bottom of this, if you didn't understand anything about the question, I have a QR code and direct links where you can go to the video that talks about this topic. So if, you, if you're reading this and you're wondering, what raid? What what do you what is raid? I don't know what you're talking about. You can go directly to this video, which is the 2201101 Objective 5.3 Troubleshooting Storage Devices. There's a direct link, and you can click that link and it will bring up my website with the video. Uh, and if you're on a mobile device, you can simply use the QR code and it jumps you to exactly the same URL. So you know where that is. Once we're done here, because this is a PDF reader, I can click the back button in my PDF reader and it takes me back to where I started. 
So here we are. Now we can go to the next question that's in our list in this book. That Those are my practice exams. So if you're someone who's looking for high quality practice exams, questions that are written in the same style, in the same vein of the actual exam, but it's original questions written by somebody who has been in the trenches working through these technologies. So the questions make sense and the answers make sense. I know, <laughs> but there it is. Find out more, go to our website, professormesser.com slash core1pe to learn more about that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, everything we talked about today comes directly from the CompT exam objectives. This is a free document. It's available for download from the CompTIA website, and it tells you everything you need to know to pass this exam. Make sure you grab a copy of this. This is a lifesaver for those of you wondering, am I ready to take this exam? Um, have I studied the right things? Um, I'm looking through a third party question and answer and it's asking me for something that's that I don't recognize. Go back to the exam objectives. If it's not in the objectives, you don't need to know it for the exam. That's an important consideration. You find a lot of outdated questions on the internet that have nothing to do with the latest exam version. This set of exam objectives will tell you if that topic applies to what you are reading or not. This is an important part of that. We do one of these study groups for A+. We do two of them every month. Our core one study group is the one you're watching right now. Our core two study group is on Thursday. So come on back on Thursday, which is April the 11th for that one. And then we have two already scheduled for May, May the 7th and May the 9th. You can come back in May for that one as well. Of course, our replay of these is all available on our website. We have a Network Plus study group this month and Security Plus study group. We also have them scheduled for May on May the 15th for Network Plus and May 22nd for the Security Plus. So you've got a lot to go through. Now, of course, these dates are subject to change and you may be even watching this video after May of 2024. So if you're wondering when the next live event is going to be, or if there is going to be a live event when you think it is going to be, you can always check the calendar. Go to our calendar on our website, professormesser.com slash calendar, or view the events channel in our Discord at professormesser.com slash Discord. So you've got plenty of places to go for that. Well, we're through an hour of Q&A. That went by fast, didn't it? That goes pretty quick, but we've got more coming. There's our after show where I will take your questions in the after show. You can submit them at any time by going to professormesser.com slash QA and using that tab at the top of the screen. Don't forget about our discounted vouchers and our exam hacks ebook that's included free when you purchase a voucher from our website. Go to professormesser.com slash vouchers. We have our course notes, our practice exams, and our full full set of success bundle content on our website. Go to professormesser.com slash 1101 success. And for those of you in the chat room that are saying, is there a discord? Is he on LinkedIn? Can I find him on Facebook? Where is he? Well, you simply have to type in professormesser.com slash discord slash Twitter slash YouTube slash all of those things. If you really, really want to make my day, go to professormesser.com slash YouTube uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give this video a thumbs up. It really does help. I know that the YouTube, if you watch anything on YouTube, we're always hoping that you will give us a thumbs up and subscribe. That's because our friends at YouTube watch these numbers very closely. And you doing that helps us get this content into the eyes of other people on YouTube, which is, of course, an important part of this as well. We want to get uh, IT knowledge into everyone who needs it. And this is a great way to keep that process going. And it's absolutely free, something you can do to really help us out. And we appreciate you for doing that. Well, that brings us to the end of another study group. Can you believe already? But we've got more to come. Stick around for the after show where I'll take your questions. Thank you for joining us this month. And we will see you next time on our Core 1A Plus study group. Thanks, everybody. All right, time for uh, a sip. To have this here, let's bring up, there I am, picture of me. We got this here. If you missed the C, the continuing education unit info, you're going to have to circle back once we're done here. So that one's already there for the pieces of this. So let's, um, let's now, I would need to change things on the website so that you can submit some questions. We're going to get this here. You can see if you go out right now to professormesser.com slash QA, you will not see that slide. 
you'll see this one. Here we go. We'll get it, we'll get it straight. Don't worry. We'll figure it out. There it is. You can submit questions for the second hour of the study group at any time. We will be moderating questions during the session, so your contribution may not appear immediately. Yeah, I will have a lot of other things there to work through, so we'll figure this out. Folks in the chat were saying, the stream lagged a lot on your new access point. Well, I'm not connected through my access point, so sorry it wasn't there. And remember, I'm not sending a stream to you. I'm not. You're not receiving a stream from me. You're getting a stream from YouTube. So it's the connection between YouTube and you that may be the issue. So if that is an issue, you may want to click your cog wheel at the bottom of your YouTube video page there and maybe change the resolution to something that maybe doesn't require as much bandwidth. So you may want to go down to 720p or 480 or something like that. That might help you a bit. Uh, let's now go through the set of questions that you have submitted. I'm going to go through here. Oh, a lot of questions already come in. So I'm going to start stepping through these to be able to find everything that happens to be there. I, by the way, I love my new access point. For those, thank you for asking. I love my, you didn't ask. I love, I love my new access points. I'm deploying uh, new Ubiquity access points in uh, my studio slash home office and in my home itself. And I'm looking to build that out a bit. And uh, they are just so well, the user interface on these and the process of installing them, that access point installed into my network in about two minutes, uh, just seamless. And it's, um, it's PoE, so all I did was plug it in. That was it. It's like magic. Um, it worked great. I in configured it with the app. When, when would you ever think that, that an app on a phone would be worthwhile for configuring and installing an access point? And they've done it. So uh, it's just remarkable, the difference. And perhaps more importantly, the, the throughput. This, this is a very well-made access point. Um, just a just a really uh, seamless process to get it installed. So happy with that. But we aren't using it for this. I never use wireless for our live streams. Well, for obvious reasons, right? Uh, not something we want to go through. So that's that's uh, certainly an important consideration. The access point that I got. Well, I might I have a computer here. I could just show it to you. Um, uh, let's go to the Ubiquity website. Is a Ubiquity access point. I'm going to go to their website because their store kind of comes up first on here. They have a number of different uh, access points that you can choose from. Uh, their latest is obviously Wi-Fi 7. Now, I'm not using Wi-Fi 7 in my home quite yet. I'm not quite happy with all of the Wi-Fi 7 technologies quite yet. Maybe we'll upgrade to that next year. But I've got a, a U6 access point is what they call their their uh, Wi-Fi six version of this. So it looks very very much like that uh, that UFO looking round thing that's there. I don't have it installed in the ceiling quite yet. We're working on that. I'm getting there, uh, but that is that is what I have installed is what they call their flagship model, which is just their U six Pro is what I've installed there. So that's what's there. Yes, there is a Wi-Fi seven now. So so really, it's it's great. It's a great way to do it. And I find uh, that when I'm working through. Um, installing, configuring, making sure they work properly. I want a captive portal. I want a guest network. There's a lot of, I have separate VLANs. There's a lot of things I have in my home that you probably don't have in your home. Uh, but that's an important part too. Um, but that's, that's the access point we put in. And it uh, runs like a champ. So happy with it. Let's do some questions. That's the whole point we were here for what you were asking about. Let's do that. Um, and see which ones that are there. Uh, some folks are mentioning um, some of the ones that we have and what's available on the the website. We'll, we'll certainly step through some of that and answer your questions about those um, and have the other pieces that are there. Okay, here's a, since we are talking core one, let's do a core one question. Um, this, is a, this is from a Loopback. Thanks, Loopback, who asks, Hey, Prof, what does each post boot code mean according to CompTIA? This, this is such a great question, Loopback. It has a lot of things in here that I, are important for me to bring up, so thank you for asking the question. Um, this first, uh, the, the, the tag on this question, um, I can dismiss immediately, um, and I'll, I'll explain why. So you, you said here, what does it mean 
according to CompTIA. This is the great thing about technology is it doesn't matter what CompTIA thinks. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the standards are. It matters what the motherboard manufacturers say. It matters what the technology does. It really doesn't matter what CompTIA thinks. There is no CompTIA answer. The CompTIA answer is the answer that is the right answer. It's hard to explain that, I guess. Uh, in, a good example of this is many times people will say to me, I don't believe what you put as on, on this training course video is correct. I don't believe the statistics and the information you're providing to us are the right, is the right information. And I tell people all the time, well, that's, that's a fine point. Let's see what the definitive source for that information might be. So if it's a question about Ethernet standards and people will say, I read, I read on a website that uh, gigabit Ethernet will not run on Cat5 and you say that it will. Okay, well, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what CompTIA says. It doesn't matter what that third-party website says. It matters what the standard says. So you go back to the definitive source. In that particular case, you go back to the IEEE. They're the ones that wrote the standard for gigabit ethernet, specifically 1000 base T. And they wrote in the 1000 base T that you can run this on cat five. There aren't any caveats to that. It's not like you can only run at a certain distance on cat five. No, hundred meters on cat five is supported. It doesn't mean that it sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't, or yes, it will run, but not at full speed. I've read so many things. I get so many, I get a lot of emails, people. This is one where the standard clearly states a particular piece of information. That's what I go by. Because as it turns out, that's what it actually does. For those of you that do, do go back to the Cat5 days, Gigabit runs great on Cat5. You know why it runs great on Cat5? Because the standard says it runs great on Cat5. So that's why. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation available on the internet. I think it's pretty obvious. I think we all know this. So whenever you run into a question, you're wondering, yes, but what? And I'll send back the standard. This is what the standard says. And the response 99.9% .9 of the time is, yes, but what is the CompTIA answer? <laughs> the CompTIA answer is it runs on Cat5. That's the answer. CompTIA doesn't have their own flavor of answers for this. So, and of course, that helps you a lot when you get into a position. You may go into a new building that's been there for a long time, has Cat5 already run in the walls, and somebody says, well, we, we need to run gigabit. Can we run gigabit here? And your answer is, yeah, probably so. We can put some cable testers on and make sure that it qualifies properly as properly installed Cat5. And if it is, yeah, we run gigabit for 100 meters. Sounds great. Always go back to the standards. Okay, back to this question. Loopback asked, what does each post boot code mean according to CompTIA? Well, according to CompTIA, CompTIA knows, just like we all know, that every motherboard manufacturer has a different set of beep codes. For those of you not familiar with beep codes, of course, beep codes are codes that are beeps that happen when you turn a computer on and nothing else is seen on the screen. Usually nothing else is seen on the screen. It's really designed for cases where nothing else is seen on the screen. Let's take, for example, a computer that uh, has a video card. We've installed a CPU. We put in an SSD. We turn on the computer, and it beeps three times. Beep, 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 and just sits there, black screen. I don't know. What's beep? Three beeps. Three fast beeps. What is that? I don't know. So you go back to the manual for that manufacturer's motherboard. You look at it, and it says, no memory. Like, oh, we forgot to install the RAM. OK, we get some RAM modules. We plug them in. We power the system up. It works great. And the reason there are beep codes is because without RAM, the system won't run. And if the system won't run, we can't put messages on the screen. And if we don't have messages on the screen, we need some other way to give us troubleshooting information. So that's why beep codes were created. There are different beep codes for different problems. If we don't have a CPU, maybe that's two beeps. If it's no RAM, maybe it's three beeps. If the BIOS is not working properly, maybe it's one long beep for that particular manufacturer. That's the difference. So that's why I will often tell people, make sure you look at the manual because it depends on the manufacturer of the computer. And because of that, CompTIA will not ask you 
those types of things, CompTIA will ask you what a beep code is. They will ask you what it could possibly mean, but it will not ask you for a specific beep code. What do three beep codes mean? I, it depends. Depends on the manufacturer. But maybe their answers are no RAM, outdated Windows version, um, the 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 resolution is set incorrectly in Windows and your password is expired. <laughs> so there's all four of those answers. It could only be one of them. So that is a good example of one where knowing the what the postcode could possibly be could provide you with that. So that's that's is exactly the the extent of beep codes in that view. So I appreciate that question. That is exactly where we want to focus our efforts with beep codes. You don't have to know what every manufacturer's beep codes are. That would be ridiculous and, and pointless, quite honestly, because you have the manual in front of you. Uh, but more importantly, you need to know what it could possibly be. And it's usually something relating to the startup process. OK, uh, other questions that we have here. We got a lot that are in this list. I'm going to sort through them. Again, you can submit your question by visiting the link on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA, and you can find that link right there at the top of your screen and submit anything else that you would like to have in that list. Uh, keep, let's keep going through these questions. I'm going to work through uh, this piece of it and get a familiarity with what your questions might be. Let's do this one from... Uh, Andres G, who says, I would like to ask you, how would be the best way, how would be the best, I, I'm with that, to memorize or study the port numbers? It's a very good question. Uh, port numbers are, as I mentioned earlier, port numbers, there's a list. In fact, let's bring up the exam objectives. I'd like to show, this, show you the list of objectives from the exam objectives themselves. I've been talking about the exam objectives this entire time. Wouldn't it be nice if I had the copy of the objectives up on the screen? The answer is yes, it would. But I need to click on this for the 1101. Here are the objectives. And let's bring up the ones for the 1101 exam. So I'm going to flip through. the 11, This is what they look like. Go back to the title page here. It's the CompTIA A Plus Certification Exam Core 1 Objectives Exam Number Core 1, which is the 2201101. Make sure you have the right ones. And we are going to flip through. And in domain two, which is the networking domain, the first section, 2.1, is one that says compare and contrast transmission control protocol, TCP, and user datagram protocol, UDP, ports, protocols, and their purposes. You can see I've already been sort of working here on some of these. We have ports and protocols. It lists for you all the ports and protocols you should know. So let's count, shall we? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. We have to know 19 port numbers. Now, it seems like a lot, although some of these port numbers are related to each other. For example, if you see port 20, you should automatically be thinking also port 21 because both of those are used for FTP. There it is, 20 and 21. Uh, for example, ports 67 and 68 are tied to each other because both of those are used by the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP. So in reality, we can take off that list of 19, 18, 17, 16, 15. So really, there's 15 of these we need to memorize. That's Now, we're, now it's a little more reasonable. Um, and this is, for lack of a better explanation, this is very much rote type memorization. There's not a lot of rote memorization that we have to go through for these certifications. But we have to know these because we often run into these when we are reading through protocol decodes. We're trying to configure an application. We have a firewall we need to configure. Knowing your port numbers is an important part of that. And it takes time. People always say, why would you need to memorize this? You could just go to the internet. Well, can't you really say that for everything? Well, I would come with you to eat lunch, but I have to go to the internet to remember how to eat lunch. And I have to go to the internet to remember how to drive my car. Oh, and I have to go to the internet because I have to figure out how to operate this door to get out of the building. 
you know, at some point you have to remember these things. There is an important reason for remembering these things. And asking you to remember port numbers, that's not a big ask. It's so common in IT that of course you need to know your port numbers. So it, the good part about it though is once you start using these port numbers, they get locked in. You just remember them all the time. So that's why for the question you have about port numbers, that's why I say just use flashcards. Uh, keep prompting yourself for what these are. But I will also tell you, let's go back to this real quick, you need to know more than just the port number and the protocol. You need to know more, for example, let's do one. Um, here's, here's uh, you need to know more than port 22 is secure shell or SSH. You need to know what that is. So not only do you need to memorize the port number, maybe it's useful to know that it means secure shell or SSH. We just say SSH generally. Uh, it's important to know what that is. So there should be another field on your flashcard or whatever you're using to study from that says, this is the protocol that you would use to securely communicate over a terminal session across the network. So that, that's really what SSH is. Because you might get a question very similar to the one we had today, which I think was a pretty good, very accurate exam type question, which was relating to a mail server is sending information to another mail server. What port number is in use? Okay, well, you kind of have to work your way back. I didn't mention SN, SMTP. I didn't mention the port number itself. You had to figure that out. There were a couple steps you had to go through to answer that question, whether you realize that or not. And many of the CompTIA questions are multi-step answers to get to the final answer. You have to jump through a number of bits of knowledge. So even though it's a single question, there were two or three topics that you had to know just to answer that question. So a, a very good thing to keep in mind, especially if you're working through these. And, and it is kind of a drag sometimes to do rote memorization. But trust me, these will be numbers that you use throughout your IT career. So and after a while, it just becomes standard. Of course, port 80 and port 443 is used for by your browser. We just know it. It just becomes part of what we do. So that's exactly where it would be. That's a, that is a very good question. Thank you, Andres, for sending that in. Uh, another important consideration if you're somebody who's going to be working through and understanding what the different options might be for port numbers, make sure you're familiar, familiar with all of those, including the description of really what it is that you're working through. Uh, not just a number and not just a protocol. You'll find yourself in trouble. Uh, you really don't get a lot of trivia questions on the exam. I call those trivia questions where what port number is used by SNMP? They're never going to ask that. It's a much more involved question because when you're troubleshooting on an enterprise network, it's a much more involved process. You'll, you're never going to have a network ask you. The network is down. Quick, what's the port number for SNMP? That's not what we're doing. We have to look at a, a, a protocol decode. We have to look at a firewall rule base. We need to understand how this personal firewall in somebody's workstation is configured. And then eventually we get to this point where the port number is being used. So it's a much broader question, a much broader troubleshooting task that we have to go through. Uh, other questions. Let's talk specifically about the exam itself. This is from Jay who asks, how many years does the CompTIA, does CompTIA A plus certificate expires? I'm with you. I'm fine. This is, we're good. Don't worry. I figured it out. Uh, this is a good question, especially when there is an exam that is quickly retiring. So let's talk about how these things normally will work. CompTIA, when they introduce a certification exam, that exam is usually available for you to take for approximately three and a half years, plus or minus a few months sometimes. Sometimes it's three year, three years and three months. Sometimes it's three years and nine months, but it's usually three and a half years, usually about three years and six months before that exam goes away. And that's why if we go back to that first slide I had in the presentation, you saw what, or one of the first ones where I talked about the A plus exam is a perfect example of this. So let's bring up my description of the 2201101, the 2201102 exams. Here it is. And I mentioned that this exam was released on April the 10th or April the 20th of 2022. All right, well, if we go three and a half years, 
that means that this exam will retire on October of 2025. So that's, that's a, an estimate, but I think that's probably pretty close. Certainly for the process of planning and deciding what exam we would like to take. What usually will happen is CompTIA introduces this exam on April the 20th of 2022. Usually three years later, they introduce a new version of the exam series, which means there's a six month period where you could take the old series of exams or the new series of exams. It's not that the content is old or the content is new. The exam is old and new. We're really basing it on when the exam was released. It's the release date we're referring to there. And when you start looking at this set of statistics, now during that six month time frame, we could take either one of these if we want. The reason they do that overlap is you could be really studying for your core one. It might take you six months to study for your core one. It's a situation where suddenly they release a new version of the exam. They don't want to leave you in a lurch. They don't want to leave you. You've been studying for six months and now the exam is suddenly gone. They're not going to do that to you. So they give you a little bit of a ramp. They give you six months to finish up your studies, get those certifications done and be finished with it. And six months is a long time to be able to sit there. It usually takes people about three months to get through one of these exams. So that's a good range. That gives you plenty of time to finish up your studies. But let's look at this question again, which was uh, when we talk about how many years before this certification expires. Well, that's a good point. Let's go back to the scenario we just went through. Let's say that we are in October of 2025 and we find out that this version of the exam retires, which means the exam will no longer be available. It retires tomorrow. And we finish the core one, we need to take our core two exam. But this, this retires tomorrow. I can't take the core two exam after tomorrow for this particular version. But as long as we take the exam before it is retired, and we finish both of these exams before the entire series is retired in October of 2025, we're A-plus certified. Even if it's a day before retirement, we're still A-plus certified for three years. You're always certified for three years when you pass your, your exam that earns you the certification. So that's an important consideration for somebody who's planning their testing process. Now, obviously, this is is an important step that you need to decide before you start your studies, which version of the exam you're going to take. Well, since this one doesn't retire until October of 2025, you take the current version. That's the only one that's available. Uh, but it's always three years. They're never going to tell you, well, you took this exam the day before retirement. That means it's only good for a day. <laughs> They're not going to do that. Thank you, CompTIA, for not doing that. They give you three years. So that's the important part. And they're I will tell you, I've been doing this for a while. I think the very the very first series of CompTIA A plus exams I created was for the 601. So the 601, the 701, the 801, the 901, the 1001, and then finally the 1101, 1102. So this is the sixth series of A plus training courses that I have created. Because of that, I know that there will be people taking their second exam the day of retirement. I promise you this happens. Um, and many of them pass. And they're therefore good. They're certified good for three years. There's some people that don't pass, unfortunately. And when that happens, they have to start over. Because now that exam series is retired, you can't pass both of those. You have to go all the way back and start all the way through this again. So that's why it's important to know which date. And I really don't recommend waiting until the last day to take your exam. That doesn't matter. People will still do this. People always do this. I don't know. Well, maybe, you know, you want to, you, you spent the money on the first one. You want to get that second one done before it disappears. I understand why they're doing it. It's just a, it's a bad bet. All the pressure's on, right? You got to get it done that day to be able to make that happen. That's just a, a bad thing to, to do that. Okay. Other things, um, let's have a look at another question. So since we're talking about dates and uh, certifications and how they expire or don't expire, let's look at this question from Mark. Mark asks, what certs will be changing this fall? Trying to figure out where to focus my studies. 
Should it be on the N10008? Instead, the N10007 for networking. Once I take care of the A plus, well, that's a that's a good question. So, the uh, the the exams available currently. Let's talk only about A plus network plus and security plus, and and the status of these. The A plus exams we already know are going to be around until October of 2025. So nothing changing there anytime soon. We have the Security Plus, which is the latest version. It's currently the SY0701, but we're in that six-month transition period right now where you could also take the SY0601. Now, if you're starting your studies right now, you're probably taking the latest because the 601 series retires on July 31st. So as we sit here in the beginning of April, well, we got May, June, July. It's not a lot of time. Two and a half months, just about two and a half months to do that. That's that's pretty tight for Security Plus. So I would probably recommend you take the 701 if you're starting your studies now, because that's not going to retire for another three years or so. You have plenty of time on that one. So the Security Plus is already in transition. The Network Plus will be in transition. There's a new version of Network Plus that will be the N10009. It is due to be released in June. And there will be a, another six-month period or, or abouts where you will be able to take either the 008 or the 009. The 007 was retired quite a long time ago. It is no longer available. So if you're starting your studies with the Network Plus, your only choice currently is the 008. And quite honestly, you could probably finish it before the 009 even comes out. So I would, I never, never, never recommend waiting to take a certification exam. That's because these certifications are valuable. You want to earn the certification, put it in your pocket, put it on your resume, show it to prospective employers. And if somebody is waiting and they say, no, I want to, I'm going to take the new one. I'm going to wait to be Network Plus certified. I can tell you that everybody else who is either already Network Plus certified or working to get Network Plus certified before that exam is released, thanks you very much for staying out of their way because they would like to get the job that you would also like to get, but they're already Network Plus certified. This helps them a lot more when you decide to wait. You might want to consider the implications of waiting because having that certification in your pocket is very, very valuable. Another important part of this, by the way, is that the version of certification exam you took is pretty much irrelevant to a prospective employer. All they care about is, are you A plus certified? Are you network plus certified? Are you security plus certified? And that's because many people simply just maintain and upgrade their update, their certifications when they are ready to retire. I told you that certs are good for three years. You can renew them. So once you renew your certification, it's good for another three years. So if so, let's take this scenario for somebody for A+. Let's say you took the A plus exam back, you took this SY0601. Okay, so since that time, the 701, the 801, the 901, the 1001, the 1101 have been released. That's 3, 6, 9, 12, like 15 years have gone by. I can't believe it myself. So 15 years have elapsed. But if you renewed it every three years, you are A-plus certified today, and you are just as A-plus certified as somebody who passes both their 1101 and 1102 today. So the version of the exam you take is relatively unimportant. The important part is, is your certification valid? Is it up to date? Has it not expired? That's the important part of it. So that's why this, this renewal process is an important one. There's many different ways to renew. Uh, you could take the exams again. That's not really a renewal. You could collect CEUs. You could take the CertMaster CE. There are a number of different tasks that you can perform. You could take a third-party certification exam. You could take a class. Uh, uh, if you are in college and you take a college course, you may be able to renew based on that one college course. There's different things. It's all on the CompTIA website. I also made a video on it. It's in the YouTube video description of this video of how to renew your certification in just a few hours. I think it is, something like that. Because there are methods that would allow you to renew your cert 
in a number of hours. Certmaster CE is really where that focus is on. But I go through all of the different popular renewal processes in that video, and I give you an advantage and a disadvantage for all of those. So if you are starting your Network Plus now, the Intent 008 is absolutely the version of the exam that you want to take. So I, I would highly recommend you go through that and have a look at it. Let's do uh, an, uh, another question. I'm going to flip through more questions that are here. We'll keep going through this list. Uh, a lot of people were asking about how do we remember all these port numbers? For the rote memorization, do a flashcard. Flashcards are great for that. I would, uh, I would recommend you, you going through and understanding where the right content would be to memorize. But again, and let me bring this up. I don't want to want to overemphasize this because it, it's an important balancing act when you decide what to study. So let's go back to the exam objective, shall we? I'm going to go back to, to domain one, section 1.1. These are all the different topics you need to know to get through domain one. And domain one, by the way, is 15% of the exam. Domain two is 20%. Domain three is 25%. Domain four is 11%. And domain five is 29% of the exam. But let's focus on the networking section, section two, which is 20% of the exam. And let's go to section two here. In fact, section two is section 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5. 2.6, 2.7, and 2.8. That's a lot of content. Let's go back to the beginning of section two. All the port numbers, networking hardware, wireless networking, networked host, Soho networks. Let's keep going. Network configurations, including DNS and DHCP, connection types, and networking tools. All of that is 20% of your exam. That means. How many for a question for 90 questions on your exam? If we do the math, we're talking about less than 20 questions, just under, let's say 18, 17, 18 questions, you know, roughly. All right. Well, maybe one of those is on port numbers because there's a lot of content in section two to create 18 questions from this. Uh, and there's eight different sections. Maybe we get two port number questions. Now, what I'm trying to get at is that a lot of people will overemphasize certain topics from the exam. They'll spend days memorizing port numbers. And then they take the exam and they come back to me after and they'll say, only got one question on port numbers, which they probably shouldn't be sharing because they did sign their non-disclosure agreement. But at that point, they've already told me. Or they say, I've only got two questions on port numbers. I studied days for that. I'm like, OK. And I tell them, two port numbers, that's probably average. That's probably about right. If you look at the statistics of how they build the exam and what they think the percentages are and how much information is in this section, I mean, that's probably about right. Some people have come back to me and said, I didn't get any port number questions. Why, why didn't I get any? I studied this for days. So my point with this is you need to study the right amount. Don't overemphasize studying on any one particular topic and get wrapped around the axle when in reality, it might be one question on the exam, two questions on the exam, you might get no questions on the exam. And if you get to, and this is, this is, let me preface this, this is bad advice and I think you should follow it. And it is, if you get into a point where you just can't get port numbers. You're just not figuring it out. You can't put together the numbers and the protocol and what they do. It's just not working for your brain. You're not able to make that happen. My bad advice to you is ignore them. Super bad advice. But statistically, not, not so bad. Because let's say that you get one or two questions on your exam about port numbers, which I think we've already decided that's about right. Because of that, make sure you know everything else. So on a 90-question on a exam, you might get fewer than 90, but let's say you get 90 questions on your exam. 88 of those questions you know, two of them you don't. You're passing the exam, easily passing the exam. So that's why I say that it's bad advice, but statistically, maybe not so bad advice. I never want to tell people don't study a certain thing. 
But I do want to tell people study the right way and study the right things in the right way. And that may be the important part to remember is that if there's just something you're not getting, maybe that's that's your buy. That's your that's the thing you throw out. Pick one topic on the exam, throw that one out. But you've got to know everything else really well. That doesn't mean you get to slack on other things. You have to know the rest of the exam cold. So maybe you come back to port numbers later. But I think that's an important thing to keep in mind is find the right mix. Don't overemphasize any of those particular topics because that, that could cause a problem for you. You don't want to be in that situation. Okay, more questions coming in. Let's keep going with the ones that are here. Some of these questions are great. Some of these questions are not. Thank you for submitting them. <laughs> some, of these are, some of these are really funny. Thank you for submitting them. Nobody else will see them but me, but I appreciate it. Uh, other questions coming in. Um, and this one, well, I, I sort of, I stole, stole Donald's question, which was, in regards to studying the objectives, how many objectives would you suggest for one to focus on at one time and try to master or become confident before moving on? It sort of, sort of applies to what we just talked about, so I thought it was a good transition here. This particular case, in dealing with the objectives, let's bring up the objectives again so we can kind of talk to them, is the important part here is understanding the scope as CompTIA wants you to understand it. So here's a good example of this. If we take port number questions, the first port numbers here are port 20 and 21, which stands for File Transfer Protocol, or FTP. And as I mentioned to you, it's, often, it's also important if you know why FTP should be used and when it should be used. But notice it doesn't go into, what they don't have here is the different phases of FTP. What's the difference between a passive FTP and an active FTP? Those are two different things but they're not in the exam objectives. Nowhere in these objectives did they mention active or passive. But I've seen plenty of study materials that go into details about active FTP and passive FTP and the differences between them and what port numbers are used between, but it's not in the objectives. So what they put in the objectives is very much in scope with how much they want you to know. And if it is not spelled out in the objectives, it very often is not part of the exam. Now, I realize a lot of that is you have to be familiar with these objectives over time to really understand the nuance. But the, the good part of this is you don't have to because I already know the nuance. I've already done this a number of times. I already know how deep CompTIA expects you to go with these particular topics. And I build my videos and my course notes and my practice exams with just the right depth to match what's in the exam objectives and ultimately to match what's on the exam. So that's, I think, an important part of this is even if you don't really know how deep they're going to go, I do. So just stick with the video. That's as deep as you need to go. If the video doesn't go into active FTP versus passive FTP, then you don't have to go there. And the exam is not going to go there either. Now, the argument that I often get from folks, and it is an absolutely valid argument, is technology is much broader than this. And there might be value in understanding the broader scope so that we can then bring it back to what you need to know for the exam. That's a perfectly valid argument. But we're really talking about passing a certification exam. I'm not talking about a broader understanding of technology. That's going to come in the future as you do more of this work. What I'm trying to do is get you to pass this exam. So everything we focus on is solely and completely focused on what you need to know to pass the exam. Now, if you personally feel like you'd like to know more about FTP and you want to go read about active FTP and you want to go read about passive FTP, that's perfectly reasonable. And maybe that does give you the extra knowledge you need to be able to understand that. But for the purposes of the exam, you don't need to know that at all. You just need to know that FTP is ports 20 and 21. It's called File Transfer Protocol, and here's the situations it's used in. That's it. So the argument that people make that say, 
you really are limiting us on just what's in the exam objectives. Yeah, that's that's exactly correct. That's what I'm trying to do. That's the point of this because you don't need to know those extra things to get through the exam. And a lot of people need to get this exam. There might be an exam people need to get into school. It might give them free uh, college credits. It might be important for a job. And they want a succinct, focused, specific set of topics they need to know to pass this exam. We're not limiting these topics. We're not cutting short any of these topics. We're not trying to work around the knowledge you need for the exam. We want to give you the right knowledge, but we want to make sure that it's focused on what you need to know just for the exam purposes. So that's that's the important part. The folks in the chat room are asking the next common question I get, which is, OK, so if we go through your videos, does it have everything you need to pass the latest exam? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. That's what I just, I sort of said that, but it took me 10 minutes. Thank you for summarizing very well and keeping me straight because that's exactly what that means. It means, yes, you can watch my videos and you'll have all the information you need to pass the exam. Now, of course, you probably would work better if you had more than just videos. Maybe you need a book. Maybe you study well doing labs. Maybe you like to have practice questions. You know, there's other things that can help you with your studies, and I highly recommend you do that. There are no shortcuts. There aren't, there's not an easy button. I'll just watch the videos in the background while I'm doing something else. I'm playing League of Legends. I just got it on the background. That's all I need, right? That's all. Now, you may be stretching that a little bit too far. So that's the important part. Uh, where, are the, where are the videos, people say? I don't know. Have I mentioned this? I want to be sure. I may have not mentioned this website uh, previously. Go to professormesser.com and follow the menus at the top of the screen. I don't think I mentioned that, that site. So thank you for, for mentioning that. I could bring that up. Always an opportunity. Got to got to get that in there. Uh, more questions from those of you submitting questions. You can submit your question by going to professormesser.com slash QA. Where I know we're at the top of the hour. I'm trying to fit in a couple more. Just real quick. I know to the the two hour mark is my is sort of my drop dead, but I don't want to I want to get a couple more in here. Uh, and different different things we can go through. Other questions. Uh, let's go, go, go through this list. A lot of these we answered already, so I apologize for not circling back with, do I need to know this? Do I need to know that? Do I need to know the other? Your answer is, go to the exam objectives. So I just took care of like 10 questions right there. So I thank you for submitting those. I'm glad we were able to go through that so you could see them. I like to step through those topics in the exam objectives because they are super important. Um, other questions on this list. Um, this is, and this is, this is one we should probably go to. I get a lot of questions like this. Uh, so the current version of the exam is retiring on the 20th. No, no, um, it is not. It is here. It is, uh, the estimated exam retirement is October of 2025. So we're good there. But it brings up an important point because people will send me notes all the time and say, I, I'm going to take this exam, but when does it retire? When is this exam going away? Well, the best place to go to know when an exam is going to retire is the CompTIA website. It is, it is the only place you should be going. In fact, I've gone to third-party websites that talk about retirement dates for exams that are completely wrong. Not just sort of wrong completely wrong. And you should go to the same place I go to, to know what the official retirement date is. And that's the CompTIA website. So if you go under certifications, let's choose A plus, good place to go. And under the A plus certification, I'm sort of in the wrong page here for the A plus details. Let's go uh, to their, what has it here? Oh, we got the exam guide, exam details is what we want on that same page. So if we go to the exam details, the, the exam code is the 2201101 core one and 2201102 core two. The launch date for these exams is April of 2022. And if we keep scrolling down, scroll, 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 the retirement is to be determined. It is usually three years after launch. Technically not correct. It's usually three and a half years after launch, but close enough, right? Three years, that's three years, three and a half, tomato, tomato, whatever but close enough. Um, so currently, 
this exam is not planned to retire. And if we do the math, we know that if it came out on April of 2022, even if we do the three year only, we've got until April of 2025. But we know that it's really three and a half. So the retirement date will be updated as we get closer to that date. But right now, there's no plans to retire the A plus at all. You got plenty of time if you're working on the A plus exam. So that's a good thing, right? We know that we don't have to worry so much about when this exam is going to retire right now. Not a problem. You're good. Keep working on the 1101, the 1102. Make sure all of your study materials have been specifically written for the 220-1101 or the 220-1102. Don't study from materials that are for any other version of the exam. There are always significant changes between these exam versions, significant enough that it could cause you very easily to fail the exam. Make sure, go look at your books right now. Go look at your study materials right now. Make sure they are for the 220-1101 or the 220-1102. Not the 1001 and 1002, not the 901 and 902, not the, it, you, get, you get the idea. Make sure they are correct. An important part of this. Um, another common question Silas asks, for questions with multiple answers, if you get part of it correct, like two thirds, do you get partial points or is the entire question wrong? Well, I will tell you that one of the things CompTIA tells us is they're not going to tell you. They never tell you. CompTIA does not share anything about their grading process. I wouldn't say anything. CompTIA does not provide any details about their grading process. Um, but if you look at their website, they have a frequently asked questions about performance-based questions, not multiple choice. There are some multiple choice questions where you have to choose more than one. But in their frequently asked questions file, page, document, for the performance-based questions, the PBQs, they have a question on here that says, is partial credit given if I answer part of a PBQ correctly? And CompTIA has finally cleared this up for us. They have said there may be questions for which partial credit is offered. Actually, it says there may questions for which partial credit is offered. However, exam questions and their scoring are confidential. So no further information can be provided regarding which questions may offer partial credit. So CompTIA has very, very clearly stated that they might give you partial credit for a question, or they might not. We hope this clears this up for everyone. CompTIA, CompTIA has told you nothing. They have, they, that is the perfect political answer where they have told us maybe or maybe not. They could, they might not, we don't know. So um, the, the part of the exam and the exam results, you do not get to see which questions you get right and which questions you got wrong. They do not tell you this. They don't tell you if you've got partial credit or full credit. You will never know. So I will tell you, if you're like me, you want to know everything about the grading process. You want to know how it's scored. You want to know what the weighting is like. You want to know if performance-based questions are worth more than multiple choice-based questions or if multiple choice-based questions are worth more than performance-based questions. You want to know this. And I will tell you, that's too bad. You will never know. You will never know. You will go your entire life never knowing any of that information. And you're going to have to get over that like I did. So as you can see, I'm not technically over it, but you have to get through it because on the exam, you will never know. There's just no way to tell. In fact, people have sent me notes and saying, well, we know that performance-based questions are worth more than multiple choice. Actually, we don't. The performance-based questions may not be worth much of anything or they might be worth a lot. Maybe perform Maybe it's, two multiple choice questions is worth one performance-based question, or it might be two performance-based questions is worth the same as one multiple choice-based question. We simply don't know. In fact, one of the things we do know are anecdotal evidence that we have received from people who've taken the exam. 
and there are people that have taken these exams, gone, they've skipped over the performance-based questions because there's a handful of those at the beginning of the exam, and you can skip through them. You don't have to answer them. They skipped through the performance-based questions. They went all the way through the multiple choice. So let's say that they got 90 questions on their exam. They skip over the five performance-based questions. They finish 85 multiple choice. They were circling back now to finish or even start the performance-based questions, they ran out of time. Boom, screen, screen stopped and said, your time has elapsed. The time is over. No more time for you. No time. You're done. The clock is, is at zero. And then it said, and you passed. <laughs> they said, I passed. I got my exam. I finished my exam, but I did none of the performance-based questions. So this, this is just very anecdotal and everybody's exam is different and every question is worth a different number of points. These are things we do know about the exam based on the information that we've compiled. But you can see that it could be, based on that particular example, could be performance-based questions do not have quite the impact that many people believe that they do. In fact, I would tend to believe they probably are worth about the same as a multiple choice. But I could be completely wrong there. We don't know and we're never going to know. So I am speculating just as bad as anybody else would be speculating. And if anybody ever tells you, no, this is how it totally is, this is absolutely the case, they don't know. It is not totally and it's not absolutely. They don't because nobody knows. You'd have to be CompTIA to know that, and they're not telling us. So that's, that's an important thing. If you're trying to work your way through and reverse engineer the exam grading, you will never be able to do it. Uh, I've already tried. <laughs> and I, I can tell you it's not worth your time because even if you were somehow able to gather and discern some information about the grading process, they can just change the grading process tomorrow. So that's not going to help you either. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm past time. Let's fit one more question. I think there's some good questions in here um, to be able to go through all of these. Um, and this one, this one is a common question, and I think a good one to mention. This is from Anonymous, who says, how would you recommend studying this material? I'm currently going through the video series, taking notes, looking at the objectives as I go, cross, cross it off as I go. I find it's taking way too long and I feel like I'm not studying efficiently. That's, this is first, you are not alone in how you feel. I will tell you this, this is a common message I get in my discord. I get emails, people click the contact us link and send me a note. This is a common thing. So the first thing I will tell you is that the A plus exam is a big exam. There are a lot of topics in the exam objectives. Look at a, section one, section two, more section two and section three, more section three, section four, section five, finally we're done. There are hundreds of objectives in here. And the, the, when you start working through this, it seems insurmountable. And we go back to that, that, that Q, that Q and a, that, uh, that people will often say, how do you eat an elephant? Well, you just, it's just a bite at a time. It's just a bite at a time. That is what you have to approach this exam with. In fact, most industry exams are this way, is that it's a lot of topics across a broad array of different things that you need to know and a lot of details in each one of these. And the best way I tell people to approach it is you start at the beginning Let's just start with this one. Uh, given a scenario, install and configure laptop hardware and components, including hardware slash device replacement of battery, keyboard keys, random access memory, hard disk drive, solid state drives, HDD, SDD replacement, and wireless cards. So there's your first big bullet in section one. That's it. Start with that. Don't do anything else. Just start with that. Go through, figure out how do you replace a battery. How do you replace a keyboard? How do you replace RAM? How do you replace a hard drive and SSD? How would you migrate from a hard drive to an SSD? And how do you, how do you install a wireless card into a laptop? 
That's it. Stop with that. That's it. That's a reasonable amount of content. You could read through a chapter in a book and, and get that information. It might take you 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Maybe you watch a video or two, it takes you an hour and you're done. That's it. Just finish that piece of it. Now you're finished with that. Now go to the next part, physical privacy and security components, including biometrics and near field scanner features. Do that one. Maybe that's your second sitting. Get that down. Maybe in that second sitting, you go back, kind of figure out the different topics you did before. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, hard drives, SSD, keyboard, got it. Once you have it, now you can go to the next section. I guess it would be better if I had that up on the screen in a way I could actually show it. Uh, you go to the next section. There it is. Section 1.2. Compare and contrast the display components. So you're going just a chunk at a time. Just take these tiny little bites at a time to be able to get through all of the content. And it is a lot of content. You're absolutely correct. There's tons of things here you need to know. There's lots of pieces of information that are going to be important. And you're going to need to go through it at the pace that you are comfortable with. If you've already been in this industry for a while, you might do section 1 and section section 1.1 and section 1.2 at the same time and get through both of those in one sitting. But if you've never been around this technology, you might want to roll it back a little bit and take it one bullet at a time and step through and understand everything about it. Maybe you do some Wikipedia on it. Maybe you go look at a YouTube video. Maybe you go grab a book and see what they have to say about it. Maybe there's a lab associated with that topic that you can do. There's lots of different ways to study for this exam. And doing it a little bit at a time allows you to really understand what's happening behind the scenes. I'm someone who really likes to understand the technology, especially when I'm sitting down for a certification exam. So I think that's the part that is the most important, is following these. Now in the chat room, some folks are going, yeah, but I grabbed my book and it's not in this format. It doesn't start with installing and configuring laptop hardware. It starts with something completely different from this? Well, some author, authors think that there's a better way to teach and they choose their format that they think is the best. But in most books, they have a cross reference. It's either at the beginning of the chapter, sometimes it's in an appendix, where if you look at chapter one, they will tell you, oh, that's section 4.4 of the exam objectives. So what you need to do is cross tabulate and look through that list. Okay, where do they talk about section 1.1 of the exam objectives? Uh, it's chapter four. Chapter four, they go through section 1.1. You can flip forward to chapter four and find out about hardware device replacement, hard disk drives, wireless cards, biometric. You can find all that right there. So there are ways in every book I've ever seen where they do cross reference the exam objectives because we are all cross-referencing them. My very first course that I did for A plus was the 601 and I put it in my own, on my own list, my own format. I didn't follow the CompT exam objectives because I also felt that there was maybe a different format that would be better for people learning. But what I found very rapidly, very quickly is that people learn differently on the internet than they do when reading a book. And when you're on the internet, you're looking for bits of information, pieces of detail that you want to fill in with other pieces of detail. You want to be able to find what you're looking for at that moment and then you're good. So I realized very quickly, I need to be in the same structure as the CompT exam objectives. Are the objectives optimized for every learner? Of course not. No, everybody learns in a different way. And maybe it doesn't make sense for you to start with how you install and configure laptop hardware. Maybe starting somewhere else is a better move for you. And I think that's where the book manufacturers are trying to get you there. But I also think it's important that you're able to find what you're looking for. And that's why my videos are in the same order as the exam objectives, because it's easy to find what you're looking for. And once you go to your book or you go to the lab and they say, this is for topic 1.1 of the exam objectives, you now know you can go to my video series and go to section 1.1 and now everything syncs up. You can find exactly what you need and where you need to find it. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a way that people can easily identify the information and, and find the information they need to be able to pass this exam. Um, no study method is perfect. No structure is perfect. 
They all have advantages and disadvantages. But mine is in the format following the exam objectives because we all know what that format is. At least CompTIA is laid it out that way. This also makes it very easy for me to make these videos. And the reason I can tell you that all of my videos are contain everything you need to know to pass the exam is because I use the exam objectives to build the videos. Literally crossed it off bullet after bullet after bullet. And if it wasn't there, I added it. And if they took it out, I got rid of it. So that's a, another thing to consider is that it's, it's really, the focus is really understanding the details of this. Now, some of the folks in the chat room have also said, hey, but wait, um, this, is, this is really doesn't seem like it's entry level. Well, it's not. CompTIA even tells you that it's not. If you looked in the exam objectives, they have a section that says about the exam. And it says, this is equivalent to 12 months of hands-on experience working in a help desk support technician, desktop support technician, or field service technician job role. So they've really built this exam out to be somebody who's already been in the industry a little bit. And then we add to it. Now, that doesn't mean that's the only people who can, who can do this. Uh, this means that if you are somebody who is really starting out at the very beginning, you're going to have to do a little bit of extra study because they've really designed the A plus for someone who has about a year of experience. So you're not wrong in looking at this and thinking, this seems harder than it really should be. And if you've never been in the industry, it probably is harder than it should be. But just keep in mind that you might want to add on other context. You might want to add other study materials and other things that can help you broaden the scope of that as if you have been in the industry for a year. That might help you um, really understand where the best place to go with these are. And I think that that might help you as well. Now, the important part of this is getting through this, stepping through the details, understanding what topics you need to learn and taking it a little bit at a time eventually get you to the end of this. And it's something that in our, in, our, in our world today that we want immediate results. We want literally an easy button, an entire marketing campaign around our need to make it easy. But this isn't easy. There's a reason that employers want this certification because it's difficult. They want you to know these technologies and the only way they're going to have at least some idea that you are somewhat familiar with these technologies is having gone through a certification program like this one. And not only that, ultimately, this makes you a better technician. This makes you a better IT administrator, system administrator, network administrator, cybersecurity systems engineer, or whatever it is you want to do in IT because you will take the things you learn in A plus and you will apply them and use them throughout your entire career. And I know this because I have taken this information and used it and known it and applied it towards my entire career, working as a network administrator, a desktop administrator, a systems administrator, a cybersecurity engineer. I've already done these things. And that's why when I build these videos out, it gets me excited, it gets me happy. It makes me, uh, it, it gives me a way to take the information that I have garnered through the years and apply it in a way that makes sense to other people who want to do the same thing. And I, I want to say that gives us, um, when we start sitting here and doing these live streams, it gives us a, an approach and a context that perhaps is not available in other places. And I, I hope that comes across in the videos. That's what we're trying to do is not only give you the knowledge you need to pass the certification, but give it to you in a way that's applicable to what people are actually doing in the field. And ultimately, that's what's going to help you earn the cert. And that's what you're going to take with you as you begin this journey through IT. A journey that, by the way, will take you in to different areas, not just in technology, but maybe even different geographies. I've traveled the world doing IT. The, the companies I've worked for paid me to fly to Europe and Australia and Japan and Korea to do IT things. I get to hang out in Scotland. I got to go uh, to, I got to go to Canada. How do you think of that? So you get to go everywhere with these technologies if that's what you want to do. 
And I think that that's something that we somehow miss the approach of why are we even doing this? Oh, this is so much content and it's so spread out and it's so wide and there's so much I need to know. Well, that's because in IT, there's a lot we need to know and it's spread very wide. But you will eventually be focusing on different areas. You'll turn out to be someone who I'm going to focus on Linux uh, on Linux servers, or I want to do more Windows desktop or Windows administration, or I really like networking, or I eventually want to get into security. These are the technologies that give you that ability to level up into those jobs. So if you're, if you're looking over this and you're frustrated and you're tired of having to go through all these bullets of information, just know there's a very big end to this. This means that you're going through of learning all of this content does have something good on the other side. Keep doing what you're doing. Stay specific to these topics. Take them a little bit at a time. Try to take in as much as you can. Study with other people. We have a great Discord where people get together and go through topics and have rooms where they can ask questions of each other or go through videos of each other. They can ask questions of me and we can really have conversations. We have a support team and a group that is on that Discord that is so helpful with everybody who comes by. If you're, if you're thinking, oh, maybe this isn't what I should be doing, come stop by our Discord. I think we can change your mind. And ultimately, I think it's the right decision. IT has been great for my career, for my family, and the things that I wanted to do professionally. And I know it can be the same for you. Well, I think that's a good place to stop. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Don't forget about our core two A plus study group, which is two days from now. We're doing this on a Tuesday, Thursday, same time, 12 noon Eastern. Always check the calendar for when the next live event is going to be. That's at professormesser.com slash calendar or choose the calendar link from the main menu on the Professor Messer website. Thank you so much for being here. We love doing these live streams. Couldn't do them without you. Thank you for your continued support. Remember to like, subscribe. It really does help support what we do here. And I hope we'll see you over in our Discord when we're done. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time on the A Plus Study Group.